This is the D6 Generation with your hosts, Craig Gallant. No, no, no. Cut that. Keep that. Someday it's going to be worth something. Russ Wakelin. You put me in an ATST with freaking Wookiees attacking me and whatnot? Now you're talking. And Owen Staten in the third chair. Gentlemen, litigation is in progress. Make sure it's the first chair. With contributions from Total Fangirl. Vampires do not sparkle. And our loyal listeners. Are you crazy? That's like 400 hours of gamer nonsense. Welcome to another edition of Rapid Fire, the roundtable discussion of all things gaming. Coming at the speed of a Twilight Kin Heralds of Woe, moving at the double under a surge. Ooh. Today's edition is brought to you by Jason Ledoux, Robert Oswald, Ken Squires, Hugh Wyeth, Jason Sally, and all of the other fine patrons over at Patreon who help us keep the lights on. Ooh, it rhymes when you say it that way. <laughs> I'm Geekly McGurdick, your host. Today, our panelists are Russ Clutch Warden Wakeland and special guest, the wizard from Wales, storyteller extraordinaire, Owen Stone Priest Staten. Hello. <laughs> ah, he's going to jump right in there. Issue number one. One of the artists that helped define the look of Games Workshop games through the 90s and into the aughts, Mark Gibbons went on to work for many other companies and his influences touched your life even if you don't know it. Question. On the Underground Artists website, what is Mark Gibbons' secret never to be revealed until today brush name? Lord Croak Russ. Pile O Skulls. Lord Orion Owen. Uh, big man, big brush. <laughs> Either of those would be acceptable, except that they're both wrong. Red knuckles. Come on. It must be a Welsh thing. Uh, he also apparently goes by MG, Sergeant Old School, and Prince of Wales, which I know is a Welsh thing. <laughs> Issue number two. Anyone familiar with Games Workshop is by now familiar with their Shadow Child Mantic games. It seems that as the best and brightest of GW disperse out into the world to spread their greatness wider than the dark knobs of Nottingham might allow, many of them swing through Mantic games and drop an idea or two on the way. Question. Starting with generic, random-seeming fantasy miniatures that one, one could use for any purpose one wished without any intention of filling any sort of niche left behind by a certain competitor's ever-rising prices, Mantic is now here to stay with many games and licensing deals of their very own. In what year was Mantic born? Reflection or us? 2008. Offspring Owen. I'll go 2011. Oh. Owen, how could what? you give that to him? What? Uh, oh, he won. 2008. Yes. Woo-hoo. Oh, God, it hurts. It's physically painful. <laughs> it would be slightly less painful if Owen had been able to get it, too. I feel okay. betrayed. Issue number three. When one invites someone or several someones or 217 someones who were caring enough to pay money for something offered to everyone else for free, well, when you invite those people for a chat, it seems everyone knows exactly what you mean. And yet the word chat, if you say it fast, what does it mean? Where does it come from? It seems so innocuous to refer to something so incredibly monumental. Question. In what century did the word chat first enter common English usage? Rapping Russ. Ooh, the ninth century. Go on, Owen. I know loads about it. It was invented in the city of Chattanooga, um, <laughs> and where everyone got together for a chatathon uh, in uh, in Chatmandu. Yeah, it was a while back. <laughs> <clears throat> Very well. Okay. I- I'm going to give uh, Owen some points for creativity on that. Unfortunately, yeah. Don't take my chat. Please. The early to mid 1500s in England, of course. Oh, uh, yes. O- oddly enough, that means it wasn't Shakespeare who made that one up. Issue really? number four. When the time was ripe to go from merely making minis to building a world for them to live in and rules for them to follow, Mantic Games made the decision to turn to the fairly new phenomenon of Kickstarter for the first time to fund the effort. Adding a host of new models and armies to the mix, the Kickstarter was the beginning of a whole new era for Mantic. Mantic Games have, to date, completed 11 Kickstarters now, and although they have had their fair share of shipping and fulfillment problems, they look to keep going strong. How much money in U.S. dollars, round to the nearest 100000 has Mantic grossed through their Kickstarter campaigns? Rorden Russ. Oh, uh, I'm going to go with half a mil. Orloff Owen. £2.50. <laughs> well, the complete answer, before fees, etc., of course, is six million five hundred thousand five hundred fourteen thousand three hundred thirteen? I think wow. that thirteen was mine. So six million five hundred thousand by the rules of this question. I guess whatever they have is going on, it's working. And as I said, they've got at least thirteen dollars of mine. That's it for now. Thanks for listening and good night. Well, 
This episode of the D6 Generation is brought to you by Lone Wolf Development. Take your game to the next level. And by Geek Nation Tours. Rise up and join the Geek Nation touring the world at geeknationtours.com. And by Audible. Try the service, get a free book, and support the show. All by visiting audibletrial.com slash d6g. Hey, welcome to episode 188. Wow, now that's a great number. You know what? Now with twice as many Welshmen. Yes. Well, it's a better than the best score you can get at darts. It is better than the best score you can get at darts. Uh, of the D6 generation, I am in fact Russ Wakeland. I have derailed the whole train and I'm Craig Gallant. And I am Owen Staten. Yes, indeed. Welcome back to the show, Owen. Always a pleasure to have you on here, sir. Thank you very much, Jochen Bauer. <laughs> indeed. And, you know, speaking of that, we have now double the normal Welshman we have on the show. Occasionally, we have I a Welshman on the show. I don't, know if, I don't know if physics will be able to handle this. This may be the most Welsh-packed episode of the D6 Generation ever to grace the it, Internet, it, Owen. Well, who's your second is. Welshman? Uh, Mark Gibbons is. Welsh. Oh yes, of course he yes. is. What a, what a fool! What a fool uh, I am. Yeah. Yes, yeah, oh, good. Yes, yeah, nice. One, one of the one of uh, you know uh, one of the um, founding lights of art in the miniature gaming industry, and still bounding around there doing all kinds of stuff from uh, very miniature games to board games to video games. He's all over the place, uh, yeah. and of course he's Welsh as well, which, as we know, um, many of the greats which, are. Right, Owen. Oh, of course, uh, but you do have a problem, gents. Yes. It's it's uh, a common oh. joke. That if you have, if you have more than uh, two Welshmen in a room, you have to call them a committee. Well, which is why we've segmented you both into separate That's chambers. True. <laughs> That's okay. Otherwise, right. we'd have to put a whole agenda to go through. We'd have to go through it all. You right. Know? Right. right. We've compartmentalized everything. <laughs> right. That's be probably fun. good for the show to keep it within the lot in three hours. <laughs> exactly right. Well done. <laughs> so today on the show, uh, having so many of you folks here, Owen, we are going to first of all. Uh, we will be talking to Mark about his career and what he's been up to lately, including his latest uh, yeah. works from Dark Deeds. But also, we're going to be chatting with Owen about Kings of War, right? Owen, you've been playing yes, that game. Kings of War. Yeah, the hotness. Craig and I got a chance to really get in touch with it at Adepticon. Owen's been playing it. Um, and we're going to talk about it and how it sort of compares to the other uh, options on the fantasy scene yep. right now, because there's a lot yeah, of chances. Yeah, certainly. Today. Yeah, so awesome. So before we get to all that, Craig... Yes, sir. Uh, we do. We should talk a little bit about what we've been up to lately. So, uh, you know, uh, Lost Chapters, uh, last yes. time around uh, here, we talked with our fans from our patrons, right, right, Craig? That's right. We have finally figured out the technology again. Uh, we did. Lost for hundreds of years, it seems. In, in the annals of time, yes. <laughs> in the annals of time, in the mists of time, if you will, and uh, brought them on board and talked about all sorts of different things. Right. So if you want to listen to us chat with our folks here, and if you would like to be on the next Lost Chapter, which features folks from our friends over at Patreon and be a patron yourself, how do you go about doing that, Craig? Well, I would recommend going to patreon.com or go to our website and click on the Patreon logo and then find, well, that will bring you directly to the D6 generation. Or if you go to patreon.com, you do it on your own, you find the D6 generation. Uh, I would completely ignore the video. You don't need to see that. Nobody <laughs> needs to see that. And uh, just jump on the bandwagon and help support the show with uh, kick us a little uh, tip basically, and uh, 50 cents, $2. If you tip $2 or more per episode, you get access to all of the Lost Chapters, which is bringing into my new tagline, the Lost Chapters found. <laughs> but only <laughs> if you're a Patreon. There patron. you go, the Lost Chapters found. Well, thank you, Craig, right. and thank you to all our patrons over there at Patreon. Now, uh, The found chapters. The found, yes, the found, <laughs> See? the found Lost Chapters. Yes, that would. Now, yeah. if we had any more time, we could record those too. <laughs> right. So, uh, Craig, what's it time now for? Uh, well, when you say that, it usually means it's time for Achievements in Gaming. It is indeed. And, of course, Achievements in Gaming is brought to us by all of our fine friends over at Patreon, which we just discussed. So let's get into what we're gaming. And, of course, as good hosts, we must let our guests go first. So, Owen, what have you been playing lately, sir? Well, my good friends, what I have been playing mostly, as if anyone who follows me on Twitter, at Owen Staten, is uh, Kings of War. Um, I've played a number of games of Kings of War, and in my local club, we've started a Kings of War campaign, which started with a major defeat for me, which is great. And... Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, so sort of lost all interest already. But no, it's um, it's been going very, very, very well. Uh, it's it's well, we'll talk about it later. But Kings of War has been a big, big thing for uh, Swansea War Games lately, and uh, for myself in general, it's like a throwback to the good old days for me. Nice. Now, oh, now, uh, you know that's a good way to start a league. Oh, and you don't want to start a league off with you know making it feel like it's going to be an easy, like it's going to be a cakewalk. You really want this thing to feel like. Hey, you know, this is going to be a challenge, and so it seems like you've got that nice challenging. Well, on. it would have been like that, except the guy I played, I'd beaten four times in a row. Oh dear! Uh, in sort of friendlies, and then I play him one more time, and I get my, uh, I get stuffed, which oh, was well. great. Okay. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, any other games you're playing with the family or anything? Um, not with the family at the moment. Um, I'm playing. I, I was going to leave it till a bit later on, but I am sort of hooked on Star Wars Battlefront, Ooh, nice. um, yes. which I know is is a, is a P uh, on the PlayStation there. Yes. Um, and yeah, I'm doing a bit of reading, a bit of film watching, but it's mostly when it comes to war gaming, it's all Kings of War and the occasional game of Age of Sigmar as well. All right. Okay. Good. Well, we'll talk more about that later and your TV shows in a moment yeah. here. So, so Craig, what about you? What have you been playing? Uh, well, um, I played a, li- a bit more of uh, Dark Deeds with friends, local, and uh, and family, and nice. it's still a fun, fast game. Uh, and I did, I did not have time to do a Kings of War game. I couldn't put anything like that together, so I kind of laid a couple of my uh, my Tomb Kings and my uh, Dark El- Dark Elves out uh, in a very small little skirmish, and I uh, worked my way through um, a couple turns of that just so I could see how it all goes together and kind of put a put a sort of a physical representation on my idea of how the I thought the rules worked and uh got another game of guild ball in and uh yeah butchers can't handle them okay <laughs> moving on <laughs> <laughs> how are you finding guild ball uh, Craig? I love it it's uh mm-hmm. not quite as fast as I would like it to be but right. if you do if, but if you use a clock it forces you to uh. it actually kind of changes the whole game because it's uh, very very quick you have to come up with what your plans are on the spur of the moment, and uh, I really enjoy it with a with a with a clock. Excellent. I, I, I really enjoy it no matter what, but I, I enjoy it with a clock even more. Right. So, how long does a game take you? Uh, I have played the small scrimmage games where you've got three players per side. We've gotten that done in like forty five minutes. Right. And uh, if in the full, it could take about an hour and a half to two hours for the full game, right. which is not bad. I mean, it's. Yep. It seems like a lot of time to invest when you've only got six models per side, but it's unlike any game, any scrimmage or skirmish game that I've played in that, I mean, you've got your attacks, you've got your magic spells, you've got everything else that you've got, but on top of that, there's this ball and goals, and so uh, it it almost, it's like a little skirmish game with the missions built in already, like baked right into the game. I love the way the momentum works, I love the way the combat works. Um, and I think that the speed of it is mainly just um, analysis paralysis with all the different options you have. So that's why the clock the, helps so much, right? Because yeah, exactly. Back. The clock helps, and learning your your models helps. I think playing it competitively would be a lot more like like brain burning, like a Malifaux or something like that, yeah, where you feel yeah. like you really need you need to know everybody's cards basically to figure out like what to do. Uh, but in a fun environment with like local friends i think it's fantastic how are you getting on with the landscaped um size rule book you know the sort of uh, weird shape on it uh i think the the, it, the rule book itself is neat uh although i must say that they have fantastic reference sheets on their website right and i kind of cut and pasted those into a single sheet which was relatively easy um and i almost never have to open the rule book because the game itself is so simple um, or I wouldn't say simple, I would say elegant, that almost everything you need to know in 90% of the, uh, of the game is going to be on that one sheet. And then flipping through it, you know, is, is fine for those few moments when you need to. Uh, I will say the binding is not great. It kind of reminds me of the old school games workshop books that used to fall apart. Um, so a lot of people locally are getting it rebound but I don't like the look of that. So I like the fact that it fits into a sleeve. So eventually I'm just going to have a bunch of loose papers and a really cool binder. <laughs> I mean, in a really cool folder. Well, I've got a painted team, but I haven't, I've never actually played it. So yeah, I look forward to it. I'd like to have a game of that. Yeah. Oh yeah. I highly recommend it. One day you and I, Owen. Yes. That's, why what, not? That, that's what we'll play. Yes, we shall. Oh, excellent. <laughs> excellent. Yeah, well, well, uh, so what else, Craig? Is that it? That well, that's that's it. That's it for me. Great. Well, I've been playing more War Machine with Rose, and um, I had a 
Uh, so Rose is my oldest daughter. She's 13. Uh, folks were asking me online. I post pictures, and they said, when did she start? Um, long-time listeners remember that actually we bought her her first uh, War Machine starter box at age 10. So she's been playing since she was 10 years old uh, and painting her own force. And so um, I won the last couple of games. Yes. Um, but the reason I started winning was we really started. Cheating? I started. Well, no, Cheating. I started. <laughs> no. Yes. No. I started using more two handed throws and slams and maneuvers because you're playing a lot more of the steamroller missions, which she really likes. She likes the objectives and the and the changing tactics of not just killing the caster. So I started really using two handed throws and throws to get them off the objective and slams. Um, and I've been really impressed. She, at first, this sort of, we were learning it together, and so it took her by surprise, and I got a couple games, went one with her, but the last game, she's like, okay, so if I position this model here and this model here, she's kind of figuring out the slam vectors and the charge vectors, she's like, if I block here, even if you slam, you'll knock down this guy and this guy, but this third guy you won't touch, and he'll be on the objective, there's nothing you can do about it, and she totally shut me down, I'm like, oh, <laughs> it was great, <laughs> so uh, she beat me really well the last game, uh, she's kind of like, it was almost like playing a person in chess, and they're like, Okay, it's mate and two, and there's really not much you can do about it. It was kind of like this. We're playing. <laughs> it's one of those War Machine games where you score points at the end of each player's turn. And your first person to five points wins, and you're trying to control these objectives. And she said, like, okay, I've got two points. You've got one point. Every round now from now on, you're going to score a point. Nothing I can do about that, but I'm going to score two points in the next two rounds. and nothing you can do about it. I'm going to win in two rounds. I don't see how you can do it, but go for it. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> great. And so she did. She totally destroyed me. It was awesome. Um, wow. So great. So she keeps me so, so much like so you. So Russ's Owen. daughter has now learned that the burned hand teaches She them. has, right, which is awesome. <laughs> so, uh, so we're moving on to increasing our point values. And more about that in, in modeling in a second. Um, also playing, speaking of gaming with the family, got a lot more um, D&D 5th edition in with the kids. Uh, wow. We are really enjoying this. We're playing through, I think I have mentioned before, uh, Horde of the Dragon Queen. That's the campaign I'm running with my daughters, as well as my niece and nephew, as well as my brother. And um, we are finally, for those who have played that campaign or that that story, they know there's a big sort of, uh, about a third of the way through, there's this big scene where you're going on this caravan uh, travel. And you're traveling, for those who know the Sword Coast well and, 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 you know, the classic Dungeons and Dragons world, you're going from the south of the Sword Coast all the way up um, through Baldur's Gate, through Waterdeep, and all the way north, uh, almost halfway to Neverwinter. So it's a really long journey up the east of the coast. And I always get worried, you know, when you do these long journeys, a lot of D&D games, it'll just be like, oh, and time passes, and I and there's no feeling of an actual travel. And, and so we were in this caravan for literally, like, I don't know, six sessions. And I really wanted it to feel, like, epic with all these different things happening and then bonding with members of the caravan and having people in the caravan they liked and having people caravan they despised. And, and um sort of like a mini world and it, and it kind of, I'm really happy with how it ended. We just last session, we just got to the end of the caravan part of the adventure. And, um, I was really pleased with the relationships they formed with some of the NPCs and how they looked at it and, and moving on from there. So I was really happy with how that worked out. So, um, cool. having a lot of fun with that. Excellent. How many players do you tend to have in your games, Russ? So this one, we have five with my <laughs> brother and the four kids. Um, that's a good number. I like four and five. I don't like to get much larger than five. No, um, no. Five is kind of the edge, but with these guys, it's, it's been a blast. Um, they don't have too much scene stealing going on or anything like that. You do get the occasional, hey, the two of us are going to go sneak off into town, and the other players are like, well, we're, we're not, so well, now what do we do? Um, but in those situations, we just stay at the table, and everybody just hears what happens, and they're pretty good about separating player knowledge from character knowledge. But uh, Excellent. And you're still loving 5th edition? I really am. You know, we don't... We've, we we go back and forth between highly tactical combat and very casual combat, and I like that about 5th. So... In some scenes when it's really interesting and there's some interesting, you know, environmental things going on, like maybe a cool cliff and a, and a ledge and, and you, know, you know, environmental hazards like fires and stuff, I'll draw it out more on a, on a grid and we'll play that way. But we've also done many battles or quick, quick encounters where it's just all verbal. Um, we played camping this past summer. It was all verbal. It was fun around the campfire. So I like that 5th can move from sort of classic RPG style with no miniatures or board, but all the way up to very engaging, you know, miniature combat if you want to have that level of detail or you have some cool miniatures you want to put on the table or whatever. Yeah, that's good. How do you think it's doing sort of, you know, game-wise? Because I'm not seeing a great number of releases, you know? I'm sort well, it's of, interesting. Um, I see it in, I, I know, a, I have a lot of friends who are playing it. So right. I feel like a lot of people play it and like it. The releases yeah. have all been, and I know Ravenloft just came out. They don't call yes. it Ravenloft, they call it something else. But um, it's the redo of Ravenloft for 5th edition. And I know that sold really well. I know a lot of people who are really excited about it. So you're seeing what they're doing this time, it seems, is they're releasing um, campaign books more than anything else. So they're not cranking yeah. out like 30 monster manuals, right? It's more like, here's no. another campaign book. But what's 
interesting about how they're doing it is in the back of these campaign books, not only is it a new campaign, but they're sliding in new races, sub races, classes yeah. and uh, subclasses and powers and spells. So you're kind of like like under underworld was great. The what did they call it? it? Wasn't called underworld, but there was the there was the one that came out that had all the adventure underground, right? And had all the rules for underground stuff. Is the underdark? Underdark, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So that that looked like just an adventure book, and it was, but it had all this extra stuff in there. So you want to buy that book anyway. And my kids have those books, and for Christmas, uh, my niece and nephew got some of them, and and my my daughters got some of them. And even though they're not running those exact adventures, they're they're pulling a lot of the stuff, or they're pulling small segments of ideas out. So I think that format's working pretty well for them. Um, I noticed that um, Gale Force Nine was who does a lot of licensed Dungeons and Dragons stuff. They were at Adepticon and they had a lot of the D and D stuff for sale there. Um, and I didn't realize they were doing special miniatures and special character miniatures for a lot of the main uh, heroes and villains from the new modules. Yeah, uh, yeah. And they're doing special sets of Dungeon Master screens for the various modules. So I think they're kind of banking on that these little mini worlds or these mini adventures they're doing are sort of sparking excitement and people are liking playing through those specific stories. Um, yeah, I find the um, the campaigns as well are big investments, aren't they? They're not just little one-off adventures. They no. will take you a long time to get through as well. Well, Horde of the great. Dragon Queen, the book I'm doing is through level, I think, six or, or no, eight or nine. And yeah. then there's another follow-on book which is the rise of Tiamat, which takes those same characters from level nine through level 15. So what I like about that is, and they're pretty meaty. I'm really enjoying, I mean, I'm adding a lot to it. I'm not playing straight out of the book, but there's a lot of great ideas and inspiration in there. And what I'm loving about it is I can play, you know, they can say, Hey dad, let's play. And I don't have to do a lot of prep. I can go in there, read through the the upcoming chapter, make some ideas, tweak a few things, make a few notes in realm works and away I go. And, And so I'm really liking that. And I think there's so much meat there. And I think the kids are also liking, running into other kids who played the same story and comparing notes on the story and what happened to their characters and that kind of stuff. So I think there's a, there's that plus like my kids are familiar with Waterdeep and Baldur's Gate and other things from video games and other, other yeah. areas. So to see those cities in a campaign is cool for them too. So I think, you know, for them, this whole world is the first time they've been exposed to it. It's not like, you know, you or I who'd be like, Oh, here we are in Baldur's Gate again for the 12th time. You know, it's, it's a, yeah. it's a different experience yeah, it's for them. It's gotta be a first time. Right. Right. So really enjoying that. Really, really enjoying it. Um, also, so I'm going on a little um, vacation here later this month, um, and um, we're trying to figure out how to take Risk Legacy with us on this thing. So we're going on a cruise, and I'm trying to. We want to bring Risk Legacy with us because we've been having a blast playing Risk Legacy almost weekly, and the whole family's like, we can't go a couple weeks without playing Risk Legacy. So um, <laughs> we're trying to figure out how to do that. I think I'm just going to put wow, it in the middle of a suitcase. That's not a small game. Well, it's a, it's actually not a huge game. It's a pretty. Yeah. Um, it's a thin. You know, it's about the size of a typical miniature war game two-player starter box. <laughs> I'm, looking at, I'm looking at the, Malif- the, the uh, Maelstrom's Edge box in front of me saying, it's about that big. Um, uh, it's about, so I don't know, that's, um, it's a little bit, it's smaller than a Fantasy Flight square box. It's, it's thin and long, and it's actually like a little mini suitcase, so I think I can get it in there. But um, we really want to bring it so much that we're going to try to get it into our suitcase. We're having a great time with that game. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, and now we've already, we've been enjoying it so much. The family's like, you got to get pandemic legacy. You want to play that next? So <laughs> the legacy games are a blast. Um, uh, and uh, at Adepticon last, I picked up, um, the new Ninja all stars from, um, the company Ninja division. And this is the game where each of you plays. It's a four player board game with really, really nice miniatures. Uh, this is the same company that did uh, super dungeon explore. So think of those chibi, but they're chibi ninjas now. And there's four different factions. There's um, Earth, Wind, Fire, Air, Spirit, and Void. Void's kind of like death. Um, and you can play either any of these factions, but then in Adepticon, I picked up also the expansion boxes for each faction, which add in all these crazy... So the Fire faction now has got like a fire giant samurai dude, and um, it's pretty cool. The models are awesome, and we're just starting to dabble with the game rules and play with it, and we're really th- um, excited about it. I haven't got our first play yet, but we've had it set up. And the girl's like, we're going to play this, and then we get distracted. But it's on, it's on the next to-do list, so looking forward to that as well. So, phew, that's Games Play. What about modeling? Oh, and are you doing any, any modeling and painting for all the, the Kings of War stuff there? Or yes, I am. Um, because, of, as we talk later on as well, um, it's been quite interesting because, I don't know if, if you know Kings of War, when you actually put the units together, you don't have to put the figures there individually. Right. So I've been putting a, um, a dwarf army together, and what I've been trying to do is create a lot of sort of dioramas about the mm-hmm. units and actually fixing the figures in place because you don't actually take the figures off. Right. Um, so I've had a real, real bit of fun 
fun with that, you know, trying to come up with different scenarios like last stands, finding lost treasure, all these type of things, defending sort of a, an obstacle, that type of thing, and, and trying to position my units and my figures in like that. And over the last month, I've done, I think it's five different units, uh, dwarf units, going back to real old school sort of dwarf figures, coming up with um, different pictures and different sort of things going on. And I've really, really enjoyed it. That's been a, a real change rather than just lining your figures up, you know? Yeah. And actually filling your bases with um, only a minimum amount of figures. I mean, I've put together a horde with only 20 figures, but just by adding a bit of scenery and things like that in together as well. Yeah, I thought that, we'll talk more about that That's when we review the game. That's a great idea. But I thought that was a brilliant, a brilliant move on Mantic's part because it really makes... Do you find it's less tedious than painting, you know, 30 dwarves that are all the same in, the, in roughly the same pose, where now you can actually, is it more exciting to build a diorama and, and more satisfied when it's done? Well, I find that. I mean, I'm, um, I, I argue with my friend over this because he's all about, um, you know, taking the figures off and painting the figures individual. Right. But I, I've never been a great sort of individual figure painter, but I do like making sort of dioramas and scenarios. Mm. So to be able to do that and to use them, and it makes the army so much easier to transport as well. Right. So it's a real, um, I, I find that really refreshing and really nice. And it's, it's sort of, because you, when we talk about Kings of War, we go into how sort of old school it is, about sort yeah. of early sort of fantasy stuff it is. But it's quite refreshing to be able to do it like this, that it's different from Warhammer. You're having mm-hmm. to put hundreds of figures on individually. They're yeah. all falling off, that type of thing. But actually have them stuck onto their bases. And they look great when you're actually, you know, you've got them out on the table. They look fantastic there. That, that's cool. I, I, I thought that too when I saw the demo. So we'll talk about more of that, about that later. But that's cool. It's really neat that you're able to do the dioramas. That's cool. Um, yeah. well, anything else? Any other modeling, Owen? Um, yeah, um, I've been doing those. I'm, I've started dabbling with. Um, I've, have you come across Frostgrave? Yeah. Oh, Craig is oh, a big yeah. fan of Absolutely. Frostgrave. Yes, yeah. Excellent. Well, I haven't played that yet, but I've been putting together a, um, uh, a little war band with. Um, uh, I've got the Witch Doctor that um, they've brought out um, there, but I've actually managed to find that Warlord Games have brought out some brilliant Neanderthal men figures. So um, I've started putting a war band together of all sort of Stone Age sort of guys and putting those together ready to paint. But I've put them together, but I haven't actually painted any of them yet. But they look really nice. Oh, very oh cool. that's going to be great. Yeah. That is gonna be Just cool. something a little bit different. I know it's um, a different feel from um, the, much of the background, but it just looks uh, really different. And if you have a look at Warlord Games' is, um, Neanderthal figures, they're tremendous. They're really, really good. Oh, very well, cool. That's the great thing about Frostgrave, though, right? The, the fluff is so generic in general that you can pretty much do almost anything. Yeah, exactly. And and that, again, is a bit of a throwback, isn't it, to those sort of uh, necromunda-type games and those type of things where you actually build the, uh, the war bands as you go along. And I used to love doing all that, so um, I'm hopefully going to get... As I said, I haven't played it yet, just putting the war band together, but really looking forward to having a go. Very cool. Oh, I think you'll enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Um, Craig, how about you? What are you doing for modeling? Uh, well, um, uh, listeners from last episode remember that I was having a little trouble with those Death Ray Designs Necropolis large generators, mm-hmm, yes. and they wouldn't go together, and they were actually not designed correctly to go together, and the instructions act- – within the instructions, the pieces would change shape, which was very intriguing. Uh, uh, like instruction one, put them together like this, and they looked a certain way. Instruction two, then put this piece together like that, and they looked a totally different way. <laughs> Um, I did figure out that I could fix it. Sadly, the, the pack comes with three of these generators, and they're, they're supposed to be, you know, ne- not Necron, but they look really cool for all sorts of things. They could be like giant uh, fantasy, you know, Egyptian monolith looking thing. I mean, they look like all kind of just generic kind of cool sci-fi stuff. Uh, I was able to to put them together, but what I had to do was cut a section off of every one of the sides so that they were asymmetrical because, as you would imagine, uh, if you have four symmetrical pieces, you're not going to be able to put them together overlapping in a way that you can't see the seams like you're supposed to and have the base be a square. It's going to be a rectangle, and then the base piece won't fit, and then the top piece won't fit, and it's going to be a disaster. So I had to actually cut a slice off of every side with a with a hobby knife, which took a long time, and I have a blister, and I was a little frustrated. But they look cool. <laughs> now they're done, and uh, they're sprayed black, and I can't wait to... I have uh, a lot of extra um, acrylic rod left. Uh, um, um, uh, crystal, like that crystal, different colors that I... When I was doing the Antinocetti's workshop buildings, 
I got a bunch of different ones because I wanted to shake things up a bit. And so I'm actually going to incorporate those into these pylons and make them look like big energy generator things. So I think that's going to be cool. And then I uh, primed all of my Marvel models, sadly, except for mm. Drax still. So uh, I'm looking forward to painting those. And as I was priming them, I really have to say the detail is there. It, they're really crazy detailed models. I, I don't, I'm, I'm very intimidated. I honestly think my eyesight might be going. So uh, I might need glasses before I can keep painting. I'm starting to realize that I, I, can't, um, I can't paint the way I used to. And what made me realize that was the next item on my painting list, which was uh, I am selling all of my Malifaux stuff. Oh, wow. You're getting out, huh? People, people who followed me on Twitter will have seen it. And I don't have time to do any eBay anymore. And so Nerd Herders Dave, uh, I went to him with this offer, and he actually does everything for me. And then I get money, and he gets a little. He keeps some money, and it's uh, it's a very cool arrangement. And I just sold all of my second generation Malifaux stuff and bought a bunch of Arena Rex stuff with the money that I made, which uh, I'll go. talk about. In a minute. Um, but yeah, so there were three models left to my primary, my very first list, my Outcast of uh, Victoria's list that um, that were never painted. And Dave said, well, you made a lot of money on this uh, on the on the second generation stuff that you painted. So rather than just kind of throwing in three unpainted or three half painted models, why don't you try to finish them up? So I did. They're awesome Ronin models. They're these kind of like um, women with uh, and they they they're the old fashioned model, the metal models. So there's very little skin showing at all. They're wearing jeans, actually baggy um, bell bottom jeans and leather coats and scarfs and they've got katanas and pistols and really cool um, uh, poses and things like that. So I painted those up. But when it came to paint it, like I, and I, I use a lot of inks and a lot of dry brushing, and, and so that was all great. But when, I, when it came to doing the last-minute little detail stuff, I couldn't do it, mm. which was very scary. So uh, especially my wife's getting really upset with me because we spent a lot of money on laser eye surgery about eight years ago. And she feels like I should be uh, having like laser vision for the rest of my life. So <laughs> apparently, apparently that's not how it works. No. Uh, so I painted those up. I'm really enjoying those. It's sad. It is. So you're, fine, you're not playing Malifaux anymore, uh, Craig, at all? Or? No, I haven't played it in years, actually. Um, the last time I had a spurt of, uh, of painting for it was, I think, after Gen Con two or three years ago when they first introduced a lot of the plastics. And yeah. I picked a, picked a bunch up, I painted them up, I got all excited, I got more terrain, I painted that all up. Um, but things around here go in waves, and if you don't catch the wave at the right time, then it's going to be months before you play it again, unless it's something you feel so strongly about that you're the motivating force, and I never felt that strongly about Malifaux. And then I realized that I've got so much other stuff, and I have Frostgrave now that really kind of uh, fills that fantasy niche for me, and the aesthetic of, of Malifaux is extremely well executed, yeah, I, I I think it's fantastic. I love the artwork. I love all the models, but it's not really my kind of genre. And now that I have a lot of other options open to me, I made the decision that you know I love these models, especially my Victorias that were my first models. Um, but they're not doing me any good. And when I had to redo the whole pub because uh, of the burst pipe, I really kind of wanted to minimize all of the the stuff, the clutter. And so I've been getting rid of, giving away, and selling a whole bunch of my stuff that I just haven't used in years. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, I, was, I was the same. I sold all my um, – I had some loads of Lilith stuff and um, yeah. that I painted and used a lot. But um, I've, some of my friends still play it a lot, you know, And uh, but I just find it too stressful. It's just too much, like, head work, you know. It's uh, yeah. I can't relax when playing it. So exactly. um, it wasn't for me, you know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly where I ended up. Well, yeah. And, and and that's not to say it's not an awesome game. It's an awesome, no. tight game. It's just not it, – that's the best way to say it really, Owen, is that it wasn't relaxing for me. No, the same as me. The, you've just got to be so on the ball with it all the time. And as I'm getting older, I just like my game simpler and simpler, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, exactly. that, that's what it was that, doing. That could be the theme of this show. As <laughs> yeah. we get older. As we get older. Eyesight, thinking about games, yeah. having to go yep. to the toilet in between breaks. It's great. Wow. <laughs> exactly. exactly. It's, it's the old man of, show. As we get older, my last, little, my last little item 
Um, so I picked up when I when I got the, all the mar- the Marvel models. I wanted to get some extra things for terrain. So I picked up the Milano, the toy that Hasbro makes. Uh, that's the uh, the Guardians of the Galaxy spaceship. And then last week, I actually found that Hasbro also makes a Quinjet, and so I had to go get that. And uh, thank you, Amazon Prime, and which makes uh, um, impulse buys much easier. Amazon Prime is dangerous, man. Dangerous. Probably too. I was gonna say probably too easy. <laughs> Uh, I got a bunch of cool blank dice too, because in Marvel, uh, in the Marvel Universe miniatures game, you have to pull uh, objects out of a bag to figure out who gets initiative each turn. And I thought it would be really cool if you had like colored dice that weren't that didn't have any dots on them that were solely these colored cubes. And so I got a bunch of those on uh, Amazon Prime also. But anyway, so uh, last night I had sprayed the two toys with dull coat which immediately makes them look cooler and they don't look like toys anymore because it takes that plastic sheen mm-hmm. off of them. But what I did was with a, with a, with a nice middle-sized brush, I actually painted the canopies, just the, 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 the clear parts of the canopies with, um, with Elmer's glue mm-hmm. and then let that dry and then sprayed the dull coat. And then I actually washed them both with, uh, with I, I washed the Milano with ink because it's got multiple different colored areas. Right. So it, I wasn't wasting a bunch of ink. And then with the Quinjet, I did it with just watered down black paint, crafting paint, because it's almost all silver. And it really makes the details pop. They look really cool and gritty now. And then I just peeled off the, um, the, the, the Elmer's glue on the cockpits. And now their cockpits are all clear and shiny and they're really cool. Just... Literally uh, an hour's worth of work and way less money than you would pay for pieces of ter- vehicles for pieces of terrain. I think both of them together cost me like twenty three dollars. Wow! And uh, now I have the mo- it's clearly the Milano and clearly a Quinjet uh, for my tables for Marvel. Although the the qu- the, the mo- actually either of them could be terrain for any space. How's the fiction. scale? Do they match the scale pretty well? The the Quinjet is probably a little better than uh, than the Milano. The Milano is probably a little too small for what it's supposed to be, but it looks great for like a like a three piece, or four right. person ship. Right. Mm. Very so, cool. Uh, and it's got all the little wings sticking out around it. And nice. I'm looking at it right now. It's on my dead zone landing pad. It there looks, you go. <laughs> sa- sadly, the paint, the colors that I chose from my dead zone landing pad are almost exact matches for the colors of the Milano. So it almost matches too much. <laughs> it's, like, like, it's like the guardians of the galaxy headquarters Please but um <laughs> but yeah so i'm very they don't have landing gear and stuff like that so i mean i'm sure if you you know if you paid like 40 or 50 dollars for the model it would have cooler landing gear but for pieces of terrain it's fantastic very cool and that's me Good. modeling oh and i spent all that money on uh on um uh arena rex so and every now and then you guys used to do that. You used to put in what you were buying next for your. Uh, I have one. I am going to oh, talk about See, what I am go. buying so, yeah. next. So, yeah, so I, I'm all in on Arena Rex. Right. I looked at your Twitter pictures. That looks great, doesn't it? Arena Rex. The, the figures oh, for that. Oh fantastic. yeah, they look really good. It's it's fast and fun and uh, and Roman gladiators with alternate history. So it's kind of this cool. There's some monsters and and stuff like that. And the the rules are kind of like a um, a slightly scaled down version of Guild Ball as far as damaging in combat goes. So um, it's fat. The game is supposed to take like a half hour to forty five minutes. Oh, cool! And yeah, we'll see. That was my experience at Adepticon yeah, right. uh, when, when, with my friends. When I was watching other people, if you approach it like a war game and you're pouring over every decision, it's going to take hours. But right. The game itself supports, you know, like, oh, fast and fun and furious, boom, 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 and played that way. I think it's going to be really fun. Yeah, cool. Cool. Okay, Russ, what did you buy? Well, I didn't buy it yet, so here's the thing. So oh, Rose yeah. and I are modeling away, and um, and our next project, she, for Christmas, got her uh, Gargant, and I have had my uh, Colossal sitting there, and... At Adepticon, every time I go to Adepticon, I get sucked in by all the amazing work people do with airbrushes. And I'm feeling like the airbrush really would shine on a model. Well, first of all, what impresses me about a lot of people now is they paint their regular figures with airbrushes now. Like they do all the base coating, the cloaks, the boots, the shirts, even the skin with airbrushes because the control now and the the precision is so good. Um, And I was talking to a lot of people, and what they really like about it is that you get a nice smooth coverage, especially over larger flat surfaces. Um, 
even with lighter colors. So like a yellow or a white goes right over no problem. You don't have any brush strokes to worry about. You're not doing multiple layers of paint. Like I paint a lot of times white first, then yellow. So my yellow pops or my red pops. And you don't have any of those problems with an airbrush. And I'm looking at something as massive as a Colossal for War Machine or really any large vehicle for any of the games now. And I'm just thinking it would be so much easier with an airbrush. Um, So I feel like um, this is my next big thing. I want to get an airbrush. uh, I want to teach Rose how to use it as well. And we'll both learn together. Uh, how to use an airbrush on these large models. Of course, we'll practice with something a little safer first before we, you know, risk really screwing up on these big expensive models. But, mm-hmm. but, um, but I think that's the way to go. I really, I'm really excited about doing it. And I'm also looking at a lot of the things coming out for my other games, like Beyond the Gates of Antares and other larger pieces that I really think, man, um, I really like painting in bright colors. And I think an airbrush would make that a lot easier. So I think that's my next big adventure. Oh, and have you ever tried an airbrush before? No, I've not, but I've seen it done. And a, a friend of mine is very, very good at it. But um, it's something that I think is beyond my capabilities, to be honest. I was probably beyond, uh, it would make my living room wall uh, a lot of different colors and things <laughs> like that. You know, it's a, So um, I, I leave it to others, but I really respect people who do it. And it looks fantastic when it's done. Yeah, it's, it's risky. I, I could, it could end up being a, an investment that never pays off. But I'm figuring with, <laughs> with summer coming, I could try it in the garage with the door open and see how yeah. it goes. And, and um, those who get good at it say, you know, since you're painting with non-toxic paint and you, if you open your windows, they actually paint in their, in their basements and stuff without, too, without any trouble, without any big hoods or anything. But um, I don't know. I just want to experiment first and figure this thing out. But I, I feel like it's time to try this crazy idea out. Excellent. When you good learn, you. you've got to teach me. All right. I'll see what I can do. Um, but anyway, so that's, that's my next big experiment with miniatures. Um, all right. What about other stuff? What about shows, books, some movies? Oh, and what have you been doing in that area? Oh, well, in that area, um, what have I been doing? Well, as I said before, um, I've been playing a lot of Star Wars Battlefront. I know you've, you've talked about that before, yes. but uh, I've never in my life been into one of these online games, you know, the sort of um, the Call of Duty, these type of things. But this is the one that sort of got me hooked. Um, I've sat there. The Walker Assault in that is just phenomenal. Um, and so I've really been into that and playing a lot of it, trying to get to level 50. So just so I can have my Greedo's face. <laughs> Gotta um, have Greedo. <laughs> Greedo's face. I love Greedo. I love his tracksuit, you know, I love his 70s look, you know, <laughs> but um, I'm not quite there yet, uh, but I'm playing a lot of that. Um, I read the book of the Revenant, um, which yes. I read recently, which I, I really enjoyed. That? Pardon? How was I- that? That was really good. I've not seen the film, um, but I'm look, looking forward to seeing it. And I, I just like that Old West feel. I like um, that sort of, um, you know, the, the image, the American history of it. And um, it's a period of history that interests me. And uh, the book was great. The book was really good. It, it didn't really go anywhere in the end. I mean, I don't know if that's much like the film, but um, yes, just yes. The, the way it evokes, the, the feel of the time is excellent, you know, and I really sort of got into that. Um Talking of that sort of stuff, I've uh, rekindled my love for Deadwood, the TV series. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Which has yeah. suddenly appeared on a, on a box set um, uh, thing on the television here. And I've just watched all of those again. And I remember how fantastic that was. Um, and I miss it greatly. So that is um, something I've been watching a lot as well. So, uh, yeah, those are, yeah, that's what I've been doing, really. And I'm uh, sort of enjoying myself. Uh, good stuff. Good stuff. Craig, how about you, sir? Or you want me to go first? Uh, you go first. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I can watch Craig type the bullets in here. He's sort of That's right. Uh, all right. So uh, <clears throat> anyway, sorry. Um, well, first, in the video game world, I've been playing a lot of Quantum Break. Um, this is the new hotness on Xbox. It is um, been quite a few positive reviews about it. Um, in fact, one of the reviews I was reading the other day was saying Microsoft finally has a reason to buy an Xbox One, which I thought was a little bit, uh, <laughs> a little bit rough, but also um, speaks highly of the game. And what's interesting about it is... Um, and I've talked a little bit about it in uh, App of the App, but what's interesting about it is that it really, um, it's, try- it's a multimedia experience, really. So you play about, you know, a-, a segment of the game, probably about 45 minutes to an hour and a half of game. And then at the end of that chapter, all of a sudden you now watch a live action episode that takes place right after the spot where you just played in the game right. with the live actors. And they've... They've done facial scans and full motion capture of all the actors in the thing. So in the game, the faces and everything match exactly. And in fact, playing the game, and if you've seen the trailers, you know this, there are many actors who have been in a lot of different um, well-known sci-fi series like Fringe and things that you'll recognize in this game. So you'll see him and go, oh, I know that guy. And, And then the show will come on and you'll see him. But what's interesting is things you do in the sh- in the game will impact what you see in the show. So the show is the show is streamed on your Xbox. And when you go to watch the show, it just watches seamlessly and you're watching an episode now. It's it's kind of surreal. It's, it's 
it's I wouldn't call it a cutscene because it's literally like a half an hour episode. Um, but while you're watching it, like there's this one little scene, uh, and this is not a spoiler. But as I'm playing the video game in this one room, we're in this room and it's been a battle here and there's some chalkboards and people were working on formulas. And as you, you can walk up to the chalkboard, and you can ignore it, but you can click on it and it'll say, ooh, there's a formula half written here. Someone didn't solve it properly. And you can click a button to solve the formula and you solve it. Then when you're watching the video, the actual movie, a little bit later, it'll be, it's in a cafeteria and the main characters, and as it pans across the cafeteria, you overhear a couple of workers talking, hey, did you see someone solve the formula in the lab? How did they do that? You know, it's these little moments that bring you in and make it feel like it's the show you're watching as part of the game you just experienced. Um, so it's really, really interesting, really cool. And the story itself is about, uh, it's very sci-fi. It's about um, a rift in time, essentially. People are experimenting with time manipulation and it goes horribly wrong. And um, so Doesn't basically- it often, though? It, it always does. <laughs> so off. Um, so off. So your character is a, it's essentially a, sh- a third-person shooter with cover mechanics, but the twist is you've got all these time powers. It's made by the same guys who did Max Payne, so those who remember the old-school Max Payne game um, will remember that was the first game to use bullet time where you could sort of slow down shooting and see the bullets swing by your head, and they've taken that technology and brought it to a whole new level here with this. Um, really interesting game, so um, check out Quantum Break. Um also enjoying Iron Druid Chronicles. My entire family now is in this book. Um, and some of us are listening to it on audio. Some of us are reading it. Um, really like that series. Um, and so check it out. And Craig, if people want to check out Audible, what should they do? Uh, we would be very grateful if they went to our website and clicked through from the website to audible.com, where you will then get a 30-day free trial membership with one credit that will get you pretty much any book in the entire Audible library. And that will be yours to keep forever with absolutely no commitment beyond that. However, in my experience, most people who do that just stick with it because it's such a crazy deal. You're going to save more than 50% off any of these audiobooks. And, of course, audiobooks is uh, it's a great way to consume books now in our busy age. Exactly right. Um, now, my last two things. Have either of you – I know, Owen, you're a huge Star Wars fan. Yeah. Yes. Have either of you actually purchased Episode Seven yet? Um, it's not out over here for another oh, week, oh so no. But um, I have. Um, I'm looking forward to it. And if you want to talk about any sort of DVD extras, be my guest. Well, That's no, I fine. will not spoil them. I will just say that the DVD extras. Uh, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of different DVD extras making of this. How they design BB-8, all that stuff. And those are all interesting. But the my favorite is actually the deleted scenes. Craig, have you seen these? I have not. So the deleted scenes. There are. A couple that are less mad, but a couple of them actually uh, add a little bit to the story. There's a mm-hmm. great extra scene with uh, Princess Leia, but my favorite extra scene by far, and I'm not going to spoil it, I'm just going to say you must watch it. It's the last one if you watch them in order. And it's the scene where they're down um, below, um, they're, it's when they, um, Ray gets the lightsaber, right? Down below that little, what is it, pub or bar or cantina or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a scene where the forces come downstairs and catch uh, Han Solo and Chewie and uh, Finn. Um, I don't, this scene was in the movie, and Han tries to talk his way out of it. And let me just say, it's some of the best Han Solo lines that aren't in the film. They are, fan- <laughs> they are fantastic. They're really, really good. So um, definitely worth watching. So I thought that was good. It, of course, watching the movie over again was also a blast. But the, the extras were actually worth it on this one, I thought. Cool. And finally, have you guys seen the Rogue One trailer yet? Yes. Heck yeah. Uh, what did you think? Loved it. Owen? I thought it was excellent. I really liked it. I like its sort of dark look. I like the retro uniforms on the Rebel soldiers. Mm-hmm. I like the fact it doesn't give much away. I like the way the Death Star opens and the Star Destroyers come out. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it looks great. I sort of feared for Rogue One. I thought, oh, is this going too far now? Are we going to be, you know, we're going to have this sort of Star Wars overload going on? Because everywhere you look, it's Star Wars, Star Wars, Star Wars. But now I'm genuinely excited having looked at it. The yes. cast looks great. The um, the whole look about it has something special and different to The Force Awakens. So I'm really looking forward to it now. It, yeah, it's really piqued my interest. Yes, agreed. Uh, Craig, do you have similar thoughts? Absolutely. I just thought it was phenomenal. I loved the uh, the, the hints to the story. Mm-hmm. I loved seeing all of the old stuff from the first three original films. Uh, I loved the the uh, putting together of the Death Star. Right, the assembly. Put it, yeah. putting, put it, putting the giant focusing dish in there was <laughs> with the core behind it was just awesome. 
You know, you. I mean, you'd imagine you have to do that modular. I mean, Some you can't point. just like right. build all that on site. It's not no, a one piece. No, no, that'd be really difficult, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's not really. Know. It's not really <laughs> unibody construction, right? It's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, I'm. I'm with you guys. I was like, I'm calling these the uh, the prequels we always wanted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, that's right. And hopefully, we're going to see a bit more of the Death Star. Perhaps we'll see the canteens and the shops. And <laughs> right, maybe the bathrooms. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. How does this thing work? Let's get inside it. Yeah, um, I, I'm with you on. I'm constantly expected expecting one day i'm going to wake up and say that's it i've had too much star wars and yet every yeah. time i see more star wars i'm like more more i must have more so i don't know i know it's a funny thing <laughs> isn't it weird. it's really odd I, I was over in florida last year and um everywhere i looked was star wars star wars star wars you know and every you can buy star wars everything now and i was just thinking well, this is just all on overload but it's a strange phenomenon no matter how much of it there is everyone wants more i know i wish anyone would know the secret to this because <laughs> it's just unbelievable isn't it you yes. know? Well, I think the right company owns it because I think Disney does know that secret. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they do, yeah. Uh, but, um, well, yeah it's it's like looking at Battlefront. There's nothing different on that than any other uh, shoot-them-up game. But just as soon as you hear the at firing his lasers, right. and that, you just think, oh, yes, you know, it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I feel like it's nostalgia, but then there's lots of kids that are just as into it as we what we were. So it's it, there's something magical about that whole franchise. Yeah, there is. Uh, My youngest son now, Ellis, he is absolutely obsessed with Star Wars, and, he, yeah. and it's great because I can talk to him about it. But and he's got um he's got a jacket like um uh you know the the jacket in the film that mm-hmm. um a Poe wears, you know, and, and right. gives to Finn, and he's got that with his name written on it and all that, <laughs> and sort of wears it proudly down the street. Right. right, right, right. Yeah. It's awesome, awesome. So, Craig, what what are your stuffs there? Uh, what is my, what? What are my stuff? What are your stuff? Uh, That's the thing. Well, uh, for the first time, I'm taking advantage of this whole whisper think sync thing with uh, Kindle and audio. Oh yeah, what do you think of that? Audible. Uh, it's awesome and kind of scary at the same time because you know this is all being recorded somewhere. <laughs> Someone knows exactly what I'm doing now at all times. So for our listeners who don't know, can you describe how it works? Absolutely. Well, I'm going to Peru in a couple weeks, mm-hmm. and I had a book recommended to me called Turn Right at Machu Picchu, mm-hmm. uh, which is as tongue-in-cheek as it sounds. Uh, but it's really this interesting story of a guy it, in real life. It's a memoir. Uh, he was the editor of a travel magazine. And so it's it's a very Walter Mitty kind of thing where uh, he was the editor. He'd never gone on any adventures on his own. He'd never even gone camping. But he was sending these people all over the world and dealing with their photos and dealing with their stories and realized that he wanted to be a writer. He'd always wanted to be a writer. He didn't want to be an editor staying in the office. His wife um, is a veterinarian. She must make good money because all of a sudden he just said, what would you say if I decided to quit my job and just go traveling? And she said, how? Why did it take so long? Which I don't think is most wives' response to when I want to quit my job. Yeah, I think not. <laughs> no, no, no. So uh, his wife is from Peru, so he'd gone down there a bunch of times already. So he decided he already had kind of an emotional connection. So he decided to go down there. And uh, Bingham, who was an American um, of questionable uh, validity, and, and there's all kinds of cool stories about him, but he's considered to be the the first American to discover Machu or rediscover Machu Picchu. And so this book is tracing the, the writer whose name I will give you in a moment. Um, and uh, his trip to, tr- to go to Machu Picchu. And at the same time, um, it's tracing this guy's discovery of Machu Picchu at the same Mark Adams is his name. Uh, it's Mark Adams going down, but he's kind of following in the footsteps of this, guy who in 1907 I think or 1908 rediscovered Machu Picchu so it's you're getting this parallel story of this crazy wannabe explorer guy and this editor of the uh, of, of adventure stories who wants to do it on his own and he's got this wacky Australian tour guide or not tour guide but you know survival guide who's going with him and it's really really interesting and I wanted to get it and read it before I went to uh, Peru but when I got it on my Kindle for the first time ever that I've seen this happen, it popped up. Would you like the Audible book as well for only three dollars? So uh, I'm like, uh, I just oh, I spent twelve dollars on the Kindle and that money's already spent three bucks. Oh, sure, why not? I did it and it immediately syncs up so that every time I turn my phone on and I and I turn on Audible, it says. Uh, your last audible experience was at this point, but you read up to this point. Would you like to jump to that point? And you just say yes, and the audible book takes over from where you last read. That's fab. 
So <laughs> it's crazy. So I'm reading in bed. I turn it off at night. I go to sleep. Next morning, I'm getting ready to go to school. I get in my car. I turn on my phone. It says, hey, want to go to the last place you read? I say, yes. I start listening to the book from there. And it's like this amazing, weird brain mind reading thing <laughs> that like my phone knows everything I'm doing now. But at the same time, I'm learning something that I'm finding alarming and I think might open actually might be further food for the we're getting old part of the, the theme. But I, I'm realizing that I retain a lot more from the audiobook mm-hmm. than I do from yeah. actually reading. So I, I read it. I was reading it. Uh, during the day uh, a couple days ago and then I kind of lost track of where I was so I rewound the audiobook when I was listening to it and I there were entire sections I had no recollection that I read <laughs> <laughs> so, wow I might be getting really old but uh, it's really really neat I could see how if it was like a really good narrator or a really bad narrator you kind of wouldn't want to go back and forth maybe uh, because obviously audiobook especially with a really good narrator is a totally different experience. But uh, this guy's a great narrator. He's totally fine, but he's not one of those few that like really pops it up into a whole new art form. So uh, it, it's neat. I don't think I'm going to do it for every book because I kind of enjoy reading one book and listening to another so I can kind of double up on my exposure to what I want to read. Mm-hmm. But I'm enjoying it a lot. Cool. That's very cool. So there's that. Um, I've been toying around a lot with Kings of War and army building, and that was neat. Like reading all the rules, really got my juices flowing for for that old like like Owen said that kind of old school war game thing that I haven't done in a long time, and started thinking about all of my armies, my Warhammer armies that are now completely defunct uh, in that one game, but very cleverly fit completely into the Kings of War. So that's been a lot of my time. Uh, can, still watching Black Sails. I fell behind uh, when I was finishing up my last FFG assignment, but um, catching up and really, really enjoy that show still. And we watched Creed. Russ, have you seen Creed? I have not seen Creed. Oh, that's oh, and, oh yes, yes. You yes, yes, the new Rocky, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. new Rocky. I, I, it was good. I did not think it was great. Uh, it's very formulaic. I found, which <laughs> I did. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Go, I found it hugely formulaic, but I watched the whole thing with a lump in my throat. It was like this <laughs> retro overload. It was yeah, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the, the, the last five minutes are ridiculous. Yeah. And, and my wife and I were both sobbing on the couch. <laughs> and she really didn't like it. And she kept repeating over and over again, a movie can't be great because of three minutes. A movie can't be great because of three minutes. Just over and over again. <laughs> because the last three minutes, exactly, like full-on nostalgia shoved down your throat, forcing your mouth closed so you have to swallow it. And yeah. you're just like, it's okay. I don't mind. I don't mind. <laughs> uh, but up until that point, it's almost like five seconds before something happens, you can say, oh, this is going to happen next. Boom, it happens. Something's going to, oh, boom, this is going to happen. So I... I felt like it really it was a neat movie if it hadn't gotten all the hype it got and been nominated for all the things that it was nominated for I probably would have enjoyed it more but I was going into it going I can't wait this is supposed to be like some massive piece of art and instead it was kind of like a fa- a throwback to the 80s formula um movie so yeah that, but it wasn't Stallone great in it as well I thought he was great No he was great he was yeah. absolutely he was great I thought all of the acting was great yeah, the, the, which, my, yeah. My only problem with it was the structure of the overall story. But I mean, compared to like Rocky three and four, it's an absolute masterpiece, isn't it? <laughs> 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 right, absolutely. There you go. Yeah, that's I will what I break was you. I will break you. Right. <laughs> you got to kind of put it in context. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So that's me. Ooh, well, that achievements. That was achievements. Yes, it was. No one could have believed in the first years of the 21st century that gaming podcasts would spread across the planet like a strange red Martian weed. Striding among them like a huge alien tripod walked the D6 generation. The astronomer Ogilvy assured me that the chances of anything good coming out of New Hampshire were a million to one. But still they came. The D6 generation The greatest gaming podcast on this or any other planet. And the only one to feature words from Wales. I 
looked up, straight into the eyes of my beloved Carrie. Hey, you know what that sound means? That's the sound of the wolf. And if you're hungry like a wolf for good gaming software, see what I did there, Craig? Mm, look at what you just did. <laughs> you want to go check out Lone Wolf Development. Um, our friends over there make the best software for gamers, including Realmworks, the ultimate way for a game master to track his realm. Uh, Hero Lab, the ultimate way for a game realm player to, pl- to create his hero. Now, also, don't forget both of these now, especially uh, Hero Lab now handles D&D 5th Edition as well, which is awesome. Yeah, uh, And the iPad version also handles Pathfinder and D&D 5th Edition as well, which is also excellent. And then, of course, the ones that brought Craig and I to the party... Uh, army right. builder the best way to crank out your miniature army lists right yeah the best way to talk about all of this is really that it takes these aspects of gaming that usually are these the onerous background pieces that you have to do before you have fun in the old days it makes those parts fun too it enhances and augments your entire gaming experience so that every aspect of playing and being a gamer is fun Exactly right. So check it all out. Go on over to Lone Wolf Development and check out all the hotness over there. Wolflayer.com. And now, in an attempt to bring a small amount of dignity and decorum to this otherwise base form of entertainment, and I use the term loosely, I am proud to present... Oh, get on with it. It's time for App of the Up. Seriously, Wicklin, I used to have my own segment, and now I'm relegating to announcing this pap... Hey, you're lucky we still use you. Hey, and welcome back to another app of the app. Those of you following me on Twitter know that I just prob- probably noticed I posted a few pictures. Uh, I was on a family vacation there. And whenever I travel, I try to find some fun apps to play with to entertain myself whilst on the airplane. Um, and generally, I was traveling with my family, so I also try to find apps that I can enjoy with my family as well as by myself. Uh, so this time around, actually, my girls discovered... Um, the Nook app, which has been around forever, of course, but it allows them to read while they um, on their phones. So my wife and my youngest daughter actually have Nooks, you know, e-readers for reading at the beach or in hot, bright light and stuff. But they discovered that this app exists on their phone. And so now they're reading on their phones whenever we travel. My oldest daughter discovered this as well. So sadly, I don't get to play as many multiplayer games on my phone as I used to because they're all happily reading their books. So instead, I went to a few single player games and tried to find some fun strategy games I could play whilst waiting uh, on the airplane. And here's a couple that I found I've been really enjoying. A couple of them are classics that I've talked about before on the show. One of them is Free Blade. I really enjoyed that. Now, a couple challenges about some of these games that are free to play, especially, is that most, many of them require an internet connection to work. And while this is generally not a big deal, it sucks on an airplane because, uh, you know, you can't play them. So, but there are a couple of these games that actually work while you have no internet connection. This could be kind of fun. And if you don't mind the old free to play model where you have a free game, you can play it a bit and then to get more stuff, you got to pay more. Um, that's okay. So one of the ones I, I wanted to talk about was Free Blade. I've talked about it before. Free Blade is the one where you get to control a Titan in the Warhammer 40,000 universe. And it's kind of like an on-rail shooter. Your Titan walks through a, a pre-described path, generally through a city, but it can be other areas. And you're attacked by different kinds of things, Chaos Space Marines, Orcs, and whatnot. And by tapping on the free blade uh, or by tapping on the screen, you can control which weapons and where you fire. Uh, and then you get in hand in combat. It's fun. The graphics are amazing. Uh, the gameplay is simple, but enjoyable. There's a little bit of strategy to it and there's upgrades and things. And you don't really feel like you need um, to spend a lot of money to have fun with the game. And that one plays great even without an internet connection. It seems to save where you are also well. The other one I got into, which is sort of a similar game is war tortoise. And this is a pretty new one on iOS Um, War Tortoise is essentially a sort of a fancy tower defense game where instead of building a path of tower, uh, you know, a set of towers through a path to stop an an ever increasing enemy horde. This time you are on the back of a giant tortoise. Uh, Yeah, stick with me here. You're on the back of a giant tortoise. There's some sort of like uh, 
chipmunk or guinea pig creature on the top of the tortoise, meaning a large weapon. Also, weapons can be added to the side of the tortoise, uh, as well as other uh, defensive positions. So you can add um, other defensive towers. You can add uh, mice that go out and attack. Uh, So the tortoise isn't really giant. He just looks giant because you're fighting essentially uh, uh, humanized little animals, right? So you get attacked by... um, well, initially you get attacked by small frogs and um, chipmunk type creatures, and eventually you're getting attacked by salamanders and other larger creatures, and they get more and more imposing, and some of them hop, and there's raisin, ravens flying around with laser guns strapped to their bellies. It's a pretty neat artistic game. Looks really good. What I like about it is as you add upgrades to your war tortoise, they appear on your tortoise, uh, and you can pan around them and see how awesome your war tortoise is getting. Also kind of a neat feature, you can reset your war tortoise back to zero, uh, but when you do this, and you start overbuilding your war tortoise again, but when you do this, um, you get a, bon- a permanent bonus to damage and other traits. So essentially you reset and start over, but you become more powerful. A great little game. I really enjoy it. And it is completely free, except, of course, there's a premium model there where they want you to pay to get more stuff. It also works just fine when you're on wireless, which is good. The only thing about it I don't like. So what I like about Freeblade is you can essentially play the game without spending any money. And by the way, I'm not opposed to spending money on games, especially if they're good. But what I'd like to be able to do is be able to spend a fixed amount of money at some point and essentially have a working game, right? Um, War Tortoise doesn't really let you do that at this time, which I don't like. I hope they change this because when you die in War Tortoise, and what's great about it is it takes you a while to really die regularly. So in the beginning, you can go a long time and play for an hour or so, maybe a little longer without dying off. Then when the first time you die, it makes you wait like 30 seconds or a minute. And then you can start again. No big deal. The second time you die, it makes you wait like four minutes and then you can start again. Okay, still no big deal. Then it starts making you wait 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour uh, before you can play again. Now you can spend a little gem to restart immediately, but the little gems are the things that you get very rarely in the game. You get like one per day, roughly. Um, Or you can happily spend two to five bucks and get a small chest of gems, you know, usually five to 10 to 15, maybe even 20 gems. Now, I don't really mind. I would gladly spend five bucks just to turn off the feature for if so it would always let me restart. That would be a basic video game feature, right? But instead, um, I can spend five bucks for like 20 gems, which gives me 20 restarts, which is pretty good. But then again, once I've died 20 times, I got to spend another five bucks. So I'm going to infinitely spend it. So I'm not going to invest in that game because that's going to you know be not a great situation. I'd rather spend five, even 10 bucks for a permanent game that I can have forever and that would just let me restart as often as I liked. And then if I want to spend more money to get other cool things, that'd be fine. But you can't, that's the thing about freemium games, I guess. And I guess this is turning into a discussion about freemium games. I don't mind the freemium model as long as there's a playable game in there someplace after I spent a bit of money. I don't want to have to keep investing money to keep the game playable. Um, that's what I don't like. So while I really enjoy War Tortoise. You might enjoy it too. Um, I wish and I hope they change that little bit so that I can... Once I spend a few dollars or even five dollars with them or ten or whatever they make the money um, to get a permanent reset, uh, restart ability, I would be in there. And I'd probably spend a few more bucks here and there getting cool stuff. But I need to feel like the game uh, is a complete game after I spend a little bit of dollars. And that's my thoughts this week on App of the App. Thank you for listening to another scintillating edition of App of the App. A segment in which, hey, what's of that? More just getting on with the show. Seriously, Wakelin, you are like school in summer. No class. Hey, welcome back. And now we're going to take an opportunity that we were offered uh, because of Adepticon. Um, we're going to be talking today with Mark Gibbons, who is very famous for a lot of his different art. And you've seen it, whether you know it or not. And um, GW, uh, Privateer Press, World of Warcraft, uh, the, the list goes on and on. And uh, Mark, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you. Pleasure to be here. Mark, we, got, we have to ask the first question we always ask our yes. guests. So you want to go ahead, Craig, with the no, honors? No, you can do this. But Mark, we have to ask you this. What are you wearing? Uh, no, well, you look very <laughs> lovely today. Uh, who? Who uh, are you who, wearing? Who are you wearing? Right. Uh, I'm wearing Dark Deeds. <laughs> He's dark wearing deeds. a Dark Deeds hoodie. Yes, very nice. Um, are you now, or have you ever been a gamer? I thought I was going somewhere else at the start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Start, that's that's how I started off. I was um, uh, the summer of '77 was a Pivotal, pivotal year for me because, because I saw Star Wars, 
uh, and I play my first game of Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, nice. So, George Lucas and Gary Gygax yeah, are hugely significant. If only I knew now what I knew then, where my career would go, where my life would go <laughs> because of those two guys. Great, great. Now, do you always been in art at that time, too, or it was art something you were passionate about from the very beginning? Yeah, um, I, I think I was... I think it was in my maths class in high school where they, for some reason the teacher went around the room and said, um, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? And at the time, I, I, every, a lot of people, a lot of kids, right? They said, well, I don't know, I like this or I like that. And, you know, there's an occasional astronaut and fireman and stuff like that that you expect to hear. And I said, yeah, I'm going to be doing uh, what Ray Harryhausen does. I'm going to be doing uh, animation uh, in movies and designing monsters. And everybody in the class <laughs> turned around and went, what the? <laughs> you've, got your, you've got your plan laid out. Um, uh, so, I, I mean, I guess, essentially, that's what I've ended up doing. I mean, it, it, it ended up being video games m- rather than movies, certainly with uh, uh, my work at Blizzard. Um, but, yeah, it, it seems to have stuck. To, it, was a brief, it was a brief period in my early 20s where I was convinced I was going to be bass guitarist in a hugely successful hair metal band, <laughs> <laughs> which I pursued until I broke my arm. Arm wrestling. Arm. Oh, uh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> and well, you're th- living the rock and roll oh, life. There you go. <laughs> uh, and for three months, I, I couldn't play the bass and I couldn't draw because I was doing the artwork then uh, to kind of keep me in guitar strings. Right. And I realized during those three months that the thing I missed most was drawing. Oh, wow. So mm. it was my like, road to Damascus moment. Uh, oh, well, I should, probably, I should probably ditch these few knuckleheads I'm in a band with <laughs> and, uh, and pursue the art. So uh, that's what happened. And shortly after that, I moved to Nottingham and joined Games Workshop as a full-time uh, illustrator. Nice. So, now, how did you... Oh, go ahead, Greg. No, no, no. Well, how did you go from... So it sounds like, you know, D&D got you into the idea of gaming and what the world yeah. of gaming can be like. Yeah. And then you always had that art passion. How did you go from that to, I want to be involved with art with games? How did you get that first gig with Games Workshop? Was that something, you, were you already a Games Workshop fan and you wanted to get in that one? Oh, yeah. Or? Well, I actually, I won, a, I, uh, I won a couple of Golden Demon Awards back in okay. uh, ooh, the end of the 80s, I right. think it was, which, which put me on their radar. Got it. And then I just started sending them samples of my artwork. And it took about 18 months before I did anything that was anywhere near uh, worthy of, of them uh, featuring. And the first couple of pieces I did, actually, I mean, now it, it, it's ended up being in a, in a, in a significant uh, book, which is the, uh, the Realm of Chaos books. Yep. Right. Slaves to Darkness was the mm-hmm. first stuff I ever did. I did some lousy pencil sketches, but they, they charitably <laughs> bought them from me and used them. Um, and once, I think once that, that ball had started rolling... Um, then I, I moved on to doing stuff for the, uh, the Space Hold supplements, the Deathwing and Gene Stealer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And after that, they hired me full time. Um, and I guess it was fourth edition fantasy, second edition 40K. Mm-hmm. With, right. with the big projects that I, I really got involved with from then on. Now, now, last night you were accused of being the man who started the Skulls. Can you tell us about well, that? Well, <laughs> that's too much for one man to claim, I think. <laughs> I think uh, I think John Blanche might have something to say about that. <laughs> uh, but it was a piece, it, it's one of the pieces that I, I've been asked about uh, over this whole weekend, which is a, a piece I did for, I guess, second edition uh, uh, Chaos Codex, which was a um, corn berserker uh, stood on a plane of skulls. And that was the first time somebody, I think, at Workshop said, let's make a floor that's nothing but skulls. <laughs> And little did I know the consequences. <laughs> the beginning that, of the end. That would have, uh, yeah. But it seemed like a cool idea at the time. Um, but it's become, yes, the theme. <laughs> Actually, the theme of... I mean, we'll talk about... Well, I'm just talk about, talk about right on the box. Dark Seeds. Now, the, you haven't got rid of your skulls when you got to Dark Deeds. They seem no, to still be so present. No, let's stick it right in the front of the box. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, with, uh, with some of your work for um, GW, what are some of the pieces that you are the most proud of or... That really stick out in your mind. Um, I, uh, I, about eighty percent of what I do, I don't like. Okay. So like most artistic people. So I the think. number of pieces that, I, that I've done for anybody that I'm happy with is is relatively small. Uh, although I guess if I did, I probably did about three hundred pieces for a workshop over the years. So there's a there's a there's a few that I think are all right. Um, I think probably the uh, the avatar I did for the Eldar Codex. Uh-huh. I think right. that, that's one that seems to have resonated with people, and yeah. I'm, I'm, I don't mind looking at that. Yeah. <laughs> um, Fabius Bile, I think, was another one that oh, people seem yeah, yeah, yeah. to like. Uh, the, the, actually, it's one of the art directors at Blizzard owns the original of that oh, one. He's got, oh. he's got three or four of my pieces. So when I go around to see him, he says, do you want to come and visit the kids? Do you want to come and hang out? <laughs> so I go and look at my babies and go, I shouldn't have sold you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, there's a, there's, a few, there's a few. There's usually, I mean, in terms of uh, if it's collected stuff, um, uh, Necromunda, I'm, I'm quite proud of okay. the, the work that I got to do on that because there's only about 
two or three artists involved in that project and it's because it was contained yeah. it was a nice thing to do and again stepping away from the you know the, the usual imagery that we associate yeah. with Warhammer and 40k to do something that was that was sort of, sort of a deeper dive yeah. into the into the culture and, and, and the civilizations so that was nice because it felt really fresh to be involved with very cool okay. um, so how did you go from um, you know games workshop to getting into the video gaming industry uh, I, I guess uh, mm. 96, mm-hmm. I think, was sort of the, the birth of the PlayStation age, right? And right. I, I'd started playing games like Tomb Raider and Resident Evil, and, you know, where the graphics were actually of a sophisticated mm-hmm. level. I thought, oh, actually, this might be something, you know, as a concept artist, maybe I could get into. So that's why I just I started doing. And at, back then, nobody hired a concept artist full, full time. Mm-hmm. You, it's somebody you bring in at the start of a project, maybe for a couple of months, to set a style, and that's it, you move on. So I did that for a little bit. Um, and then got, as a freelancer, then got hired by Sony uh, to go work in-house at their Cambridge studio in the UK. Uh, I ended up being a, a lead, uh, an art lead there, so mm-hmm. suddenly transitioned into a more management role. Um, did that for about four years, decided management was not something I was wildly keen on. <laughs> so went back for a second stint at workshop uh, for about 18 months, then got hired by um, Blizzard to come out to California because Andy Chambers of course you know I'm sure everybody on this on this knows yes. uh, he actually went to Blizzard uh, to work on Starcraft 2 right. ahead of me and I said oh man I'd love to go and live in California for a bit so you know let them know I'm interested I just think yeah. the whole the whole the whole circle of life on Blizzard's a lot of Blizzard's games inspired by Games Workshop products right. and then the, a lot of the creative minds of Games Workshop going back yeah. To take the, the Blizzard stuff to the next level is a really interesting story. Yeah, yeah. Because, um, I mean, obviously, StarCraft is heavily influenced by 40K, obviously. And and, it, and there was even some one-liners in World of Warcraft, or Warcraft, the old Warcraft like Wars my, versus Humans, where... Like my Warhammer Cross My Warhammer Cross 40K. 40K, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a, yeah there's, a, there's a lot of guys, particularly, you know, uh, uh, the older guys up there, Sam Didier and Chris Metzen, uh, who are, you know, big, big Warhammer fans. I mean, Metzen, I know, plays plays 40k now he got back into it and got very right. excited about it all uh, so yeah it's a you know it's a there's a I think there's a, a, a sort of common f- uh, a well that we drink yeah. from yeah. right that, that that overblown heroic fantasy stuff right right is a yeah common themes throughout now, now in, in uh, was it very different working for the video game industry than it was working for for the for the miniature gaming industry uh, well I mean for me primarily I was doing concept art mm-hmm. where I get I, obviously with workshop um, it was mainly illustration mm-hmm. although sometimes I'd do, I'd do the illustration before the miniature got designed so the, mm-hmm. the art right. acted as concept art uh, yeah so for me it was um, I, and my, the methodology the approach is not really different but the fact is I was I was kind of cranking out concept art right. uh, to, again to feed a team sometimes of 150 artists yeah. I'm not single handedly you know but certainly it, it's about throwing ideas against the wall so yeah the the uh, uh, I, and what you do as a concept artist, obviously, it's not the end, the end of the line, it's the beginning right. of, the, of the process. Then somebody's got to build it in three dimensions, you know, throw it into the game, animate right. it, give it personality. That was a lot of fun to see sketches turned see into sort of come sort to of kind of like living, breathing That's things cool. you can interact cool. with. That was amazing. Yeah. That was lots of fun to see that happen. Very cool. Uh, how long does it take you to do an image like that, like a concept? I mean, you, it sounded like you had to crank a lot of these out. What's a typical day? I mean, how I, many I would, do you put out in a, in a I, week? I would try right? and get like at least one a day. Yeah. I think in the four years I was concept uh, concept artist on uh, World of Warcraft I think I did something uh, in excess of 1200 pieces of mm-hmm. art uh, and maybe half of those made it into something in game yeah. so, so for me that 50% hit rate is actually pretty good yeah. you know great yeah well, well listeners will know I'm also a huge War Machine fan and I know you've done some work for Private Tip Press I have yeah. what are some of the pieces that you've done for, for them that you that stand out um, uh, I did some K-Door stuff I did this, mm-hmm. the, the Spriggan yeah um Hang on, what else was there? This is a few. This is like ten years ago now. I think. Yeah. Since, since wow. My last oh, that's right at the beginning. <laughs> oh, the Hammersmith. Yep. Um, uh, uh, Maulers. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, a couple of uh, protectorate pieces as mm-hmm. well. I can't remember. I can't remember which ones now. Yeah, no, I mean, not a great deal for them. Um, yep. But it's. I mean, it's. <laughs> yeah, I think over the years, but I think I think Wizards of the Coast are the only one I. Probably haven't. Worked worked for. I did a little bit, a little bit, little bit for Rackham back in the day. Actually, Grenadier way, way really? back in the day. Wow. Yeah. So is it more of a freelance kind of thing, or you just bounce it from? And how's that? So my wife's a freelance writer, so I right. kind of get how they work. But yeah. it sounds like you've touched a lot of companies, but I can't imagine jumping them each or that, that how it works. 
just going to hop from place to place, project to project. It, it has been. It's, it's sometimes it's been. Oh, I like it's because it, you always start with me seeing some miniatures I like, you know? <laughs> right. and I, I like to paint some of these. And I, you know, I literally, literally paint the models, yeah. and then yeah. say, oh, I should maybe call these guys paintings up. <laughs> of these <laughs> models. So it's essentially fan art that I get paid for. You know. Oh, I see. So you, you get inspired because you start playing in the new game, whatever it is. Yeah. You draw a couple pictures, and yeah. you're like, I, I should send these to the guys and see what they think of it. What's weird is when I when I start working on, on games professionally I stop yeah. playing the games oh, right. it's, it's always been the way it's really it's strange it's, fun. Know, it's, it's work, work. Right? but then it becomes work yeah <laughs> I, I have to find another hobby because <laughs> I'm not it, you know I played World of Warcraft mm-hmm. pretty heavily even when I went to Blizzard because I, I started Blizzard as, uh, on, um, on Diablo 3 yep. and I was continuing to play WoW and then I moved to the WoW team stop, stop playing didn't WoW. play another day in WoW no I so want yeah, to ask, oh, ask you because I know a lot of listeners I mean I want to do them some service too. We asked some of our favorite pieces from 40K and from yeah. from uh, Privateer. What are some of the pieces from the Blizzard line that people might recognize or, or, or know from your work? Either WoW or Diablo. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, in terms of it's character design yeah. stuff, and it's it's things like the uh, it, uh, if you know um, the Wrath of the Lich King expansion. Yeah. I did the concept up for the Vrykul, yeah, yeah, the oh, giant yeah, Vikings. Cool, yeah. um, I did it. Well, I did. I did sort of. From, from tier 10 to tier 14 all the armor sets oh cool designed oh, cool. all those so you're not doing just people you're doing like armor and, and weapons oh and yeah stuff? yeah you, you sort of you mix, end up mixing it up and doing oh, a lot cool. of stuff the um, um, I think the thing I was most proud of and enjoyed the most was the whole Worgen starting experience from Cataclysm oh yeah yeah so I did all the concept art well, that got really stuff. highly rated too it was very engaging for, it, it, was for, a, that, for that was, it was just a really sweet spot there because yeah. the designers were really excited by it and mm-hmm. so it was just it's really really collaborative the energy got going yeah. yeah it was really that was a lot of fun I mean the Goblin stuff too as well doing, doing Kazan and then all the crazy all the fun little um, homages and there's a, there's, if you've played the, the the goblin starting experience, you know there's a little Zoolander homage. Yes. There's little goblins in a, in a gas station, <laughs> dancing, and throwing throwing all the, all the gasoline around. Right. Um, so stuff like that is just it, there's, there's such a sort of joyous uh, irreverence yeah. uh, in the um, in the wow stuff, but also at the same time, it can, you know, some of it can be very very moving and very and and, uh, and very heartfelt. So I, I did really enjoy that that mixture, that balance. Mm. It wasn't all the grim dark, you know. <laughs> right, right. It was nice to get some of that levity and then mix it up. Cool. Now with the new movie coming out, are any of the things that you maybe started the ball rolling? Are you seeing any of that in the previews that we're seeing now with the new World Warcraft movie? No, I wasn't. I wasn't involved with uh, with any of that. I don't. Um, I think when I was when I was still there, the, the, there was it was going on behind the scenes. Okay. Mm. Scripts were being talked about oh, and really? deals were being discussed, but. Uh, nothing had been had been. But the character, con- not, not the creatures or the characters. No, 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 I didn't do any of that stuff. Okay. So I can't shed any light on what. Yeah. Me, not that I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I got. I live in. I live just south of LA. I can't go back to Hollywood if I <laughs> oh, spill the beans on a movie. Okay. They won't you let me back yeah. in. The, my my privileges will be revoked. <laughs> <laughs> that seems fair. So how did you get involved with? Um, with uh, games and gears on on the Dark Deeds project. Uh, well, after I, I after I left Blizzard, I went up the road to, to work at Riot for a couple of years, mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, doing working on the sort of the, the background behind League of Legends, building out the, the, the wider world. Actually, now with a couple of uh, ex Games Workshop writers, um, Anthony Reynolds and Gray McNeil are both there now. Well, doing, I should ask you amazing be- stuff. So before you leave the, the League of Legends yeah. stuff, I know a lot of listeners play League of Legends too. Right. What are some of the pieces they recognize from that one? Nothing. <laughs> No, it was all top secret stuff behind closed doors. Oh, it's all I, I, worked on, I worked on a couple of champ uh, reworks. I, I worked on the rework of Twitch. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, and I did I I, I did uh, concept art for Jinx's weapons. Yep. Uh, so little bits and pieces, but most of the stuff. I mean, if they're players and they've seen they, if they've seen any event stuff, uh, anything to do with Bill's Rot that's come out in the last sort of uh, year or so. Right. I, I did all the concept art for that stuff, yeah, all the yeah. background stuff for that. Um, but no, I, uh, after I, I was there for two years, my green card arrived, <laughs> and I decided I wanted to uh, try my hand at freelancing again. So uh, this was July last year, so I quit Riot, started working from home, well, sat around at home in my underwear for a month, <laughs> and then the phone rang. As you do, right? <laughs> and the phone, the phone rang at the right time, essentially, and it was Andy saying, oh, you're freelancer, well, I'm, I'm, there's a game I'm working on we need art for. I said, what can you tell me about it? He said, it's called Dark Deeds. I said, that's all I need to know. Let's go. So, can I and put a skull on the cover? Yeah, right? really, yeah. <laughs> and at the time, it was just, yeah, we need sort of about 30 cards illustrated, mm-hmm. but that turned into 100. I was going to say, it's a lot more than 30. Yeah, and then, of course, it, it, I was, since I was the only artist, um, it, it means designing the logo, designing, you know, the, 
the every, name. Every, the name is yeah, doing the, the, the little the, daggers hidden in there. Exactly, yeah. So doing all that stuff. Uh, everything from the the icons on the on the cards, the little banners, even doing the layout for the rule for the book. Graphic design. It, and it's, everything. It's, it's 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 everything, which was challenging and and probably the busiest I've been for the three four months. Have you ever done do anything it. to that level with a game before? No. Um, no, I've, I, you've kind of touched on it. I've done a little bit of UI design right, and stuff right. like that at, at, at places like Blizzard and things. Mm. But I've never never been that engaged with it. And, mm. of course, even once the game's wrapped, you end up working on the marketing materials right. and, the, and the ads and yeah. stuff like that. And it's, you know, merchandise, like designs for the, the, the hood, the tasteful hoodies we're all sat around lovely, in. The lovely hoodies. Yeah. Well, you want to have that consistent look and feel on that brand all the yeah. way through, which is... And I, you can, I think one thing that our listeners should understand who have not seen Dark Deeds yet is... Really, what's most appealing and amazing about this game is twofold. One, which is the theme that, um, which it sounds like that came from Andy, the idea of your... Yes. Was that collaborative or was that Andy thinking through we're going to be basically mugging people on the street? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, Andy worked with the, our designers, Ryan Miller, who, yeah. who you, you, people may know from Wizards of the Coast. And right. So he's, he, he designed the, 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 the fundamental mm-hmm. hardcore the game. Yeah, yeah, the engine, if you yeah. will, of the game, the basic design. And Andy comes in and he gives it all the flavor. I mean, he had the, I think, the overview of what he, sort of game he wanted to do. Right. And he injects all the flavor. Um, but they brought me on. It was still, it was still kind of fairly vanilla in terms of what, we needed, what they needed the cards to be. It was mm-hmm. like, well, we need um, a bunch of clerics. No idea what those faiths should be. We need, some, right. we need some merchants. No idea what they should be trading in. So that was, you know, I, I then got the opportunity to say, well, I, uh, here's what I'd like to draw. Here's what I think would be, would be fun and be cool. And kind of tie those in with the loot cards mm-hmm. that, that, that the various uh, 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 citizens of the city generate. Right. Just so it made some sort of internal logic to me as an artist anyway. I think it's, it's, it's amazing because I think the two parts of the game, one of the theme, and it's, it's dripping with theme, right. but that's in, thanks to, in large part, or... or mainly because of the fantastic the art ambience and the ambiance of the whole game and how that comes through to not only the cover but the as Craig mentioned earlier the font and the logo and then all the way down to each card there's definitely a feeling and a flavor throughout this game Is that- can you talk to us a little bit about what was the um Inspirations for sort of the style that you went with. Yeah, well, I, I really wanted it to feel like um, potentially this this was something that had come from the fantasy world that it's set in. Right. So you could walk into a tavern in in the city of Anthran mm-hmm. and essentially see this game laid out. So the cards will all have a, a, a sort of a textured, stained, battered feel to it. The uh, uh, the suspicion marks that you accrue during the game are all actual wood that they, and we picked wood that had a heavy grain so when we stained it you could, you could feel it the coin the most suspicious minion coin that gets passed around is a metal coin mm-hmm. we, we had to make some concessions to um, uh, durability and availability we couldn't for instance make the street map out of flayed human skin which is what I was going for apparently the lead time on that is really long <laughs> so we had to make it as a play mat you know uh-huh. but again we went with a high quality rubber play mat it's nice, yeah. Uh, so yeah things like that it's um, so that was yeah we, we really wanted to set a, a high mark in terms of uh, quality of the components again make it feel like right. it, it's, it, it's got there's something of a sort of artifact mm-hmm. about it so yeah I think uh, certainly, moving forward, whatever we, we uh, where we go next, we, it's something we're gonna we're gonna maintain that uh, that flavor. Yeah, and now, what about like the char- The characters look so characterful, if you will. Thank you. And uh, what's the the? Is there a specific inspiration or something that fed you guys in this general direction, where the characters are? Uh, th- their characters cheers a little yeah. bit, but. At the same time, they're they're very realistic. Also, it's yeah. It's I mean, it interesting. Was, it, it's it was hard kind to of, dis- describe. It was, it was wanting to keep, uh, to keep it sort of whims. Again, I, I mean, when you're looking at you know these are these are standard uh, uh, card sizes, right? So three and a half inches by two and a half inches, your typical tra- trading right. card size. So yeah, there's a limited amount of, of real estate, you know, on the card there. So for me, it was about okay. Well, I want to make sure that these characters really pop. Mm-hmm. So it was coming up with facial expressions and poses and angles that, that really helped help uh, help sell uh, sell the nature of that sort of stuff and, and it was a lot of me posing in front of the mirror with my iPhone <laughs> for reference you know nice. and trying not to make then every character look like me but it gave me give me a good ground well, now that you mention it uh, yeah there's a few of them there's a few of them a little bit too close for comfort I realise I think with what with the next, with now with any subsequent cards I'm doing because we're doing like little booster packs and things yep. I'm, I'm going out of my way to not Find make it people. me. <laughs> um, even if it is me, make sure I, I, I push the features uh, a certain way. Um, but we're also talking, because Andy and I are talking a lot about 
um, the background to the world, which we sketched out lightly, really, in this game. Now, did but, you make this world, or did, did you and Andy make it out of whole cloth, or was there an inspiration for the name of the city and everything else that it come from anything, or is it right well, out of... From what I understand, um, yeah, Andy, uh, uh, this, this, the great port city of Anthrand, is a location in, uh, uh, I think it's a D&D campaign that he's been playing for something like 20 years. Wow. I think it's Adrian Wood. He gets a credit in the book oh, really? as, as the, the, the dungeon master for that. Oh, wow. So, oh, it's, wow. so, it so was, it's a city that Andy's been you know, living in as an RPG character yeah. for 20 years. Yeah. So he knows it. So are the characters actually from that? The names of some of the characters, like the prince or anything from that? Or is it the city name? or? or? Um, you know what? I, I, I haven't... I haven't spoken any great length uh, with Andy about it some of them maybe but I think some of it is just it's just little, the, the archaic names mm-hmm. and things that have been, yeah. have been drafted up because I say n- there was very little of that in place initially I think Andy had a, had a great overview of, of, the, of the world location mm-hmm. Um, I guess we scratched the surface of it a little bit right. with this one. But I'm, I'm working on a website now, which hopefully will be live for the launch of the game next month. And, and Andy's provided me. We're back. We're, we're, we're bouncing back and forth with the, the sort of the races that we don't. Oh, cool. we, we touch a little bit on in the game. There's a few of the characters that are clearly not human. Right. But we're talking about okay, what what spins do we want to put on the great uh, nice. sort of fantasy tropes for these races? So again, it's, it's light-hearted, whimsical. It's it's there's a darkness to it. But it's playful. It's. I mean, we talk about things like, um, like the Monty Python movies, particularly something like the Holy Grail. There's a, it, it has a feel of mm. have Terry Pratchett's and more yes. pork in there as well. So we want a city where potentially we could set any kind of game we wanted within yeah. within, within a vague, loose yeah. sort of fantasy uh, constraints. It definitely has that feeling, and you can tell with the inspiration from a variety I mean, of sources. A lot of, the, a lot of the, the characters could have popped right off the cover of a Terry Pratchett novel. Oh, well, thank you very which much. Is, which, which I love. I'm a huge fan. Yeah, me right. too. <laughs> and, um, and it's just, and that's kind of how it feels. It feels, I mean, you're, ba- we haven't even talked about the game. You're, you're, a, you're a bad guy, you're a you minion, are. and you're serving some dark, mysterious, dark patron. And you're just out there trying to mug people and maybe or maybe not kill them and steal their stuff. Exactly. And all the character drawings just fit into that mold so well um, that you can just imagine that, you know, it's Nobby and all well, we, the characters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we, I mean, we hope that, 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 you know, the nature of the cards, because all the character cards have got a little quote on yeah, them, they're yeah, named right. characters. Well, we hope it encourages a little bit of role-playing when yeah, you're playing right. the game, right? You do the voices. Yeah, well, you have to. Yeah. You have to. Well, I think, and I think that's what the attention to detail you, you've really put in here speaks to, right? I mean, the, if you look, there's a bag that holds all the... Burlap uh, sack. A burlap sack, yeah. a literal burlap sack yeah. that holds the inspiration, or the suspicion tokens, right? But but even the sack's got the logo on it, you know? And it's all skull. about branding, man. Huh? Right, is. right. But it's also about, as I look at the set, as I look at it as a player and as I play... I am reminded I'm in this world at everything I glance, whether it's also, the card, the side like, of the box, like you said, the it's rule book. Artifacts. Right. It's, it's yeah. I mean, that's we, we're talking a little bit about what we might want to do for uh, the booster packs at future events, and it's it's kind of beyond the well. We'll do some more cards, and we'll do some mm. you know some new little items about mechanics. It's like what right. can we give what can we give players that again draws them into the world more. Mm. Not necessarily things that are that are absolutely vital to play the game. Right. What about some little sort of peripherals almost again? Right. Feed into that, and you have that. that. You have the tuck boxes here, which a yeah. lot of a lot of hardcore board gamers will will make their own tuck boxes. And here, yours are they're they're pre weathered, exactly. little, little, yeah. little pre stained yeah. for yeah. you there. Yeah. And again, it gives you that little, sense of like little quote, little quotes, a smile, a blade, a bad a bad deal made. <laughs> yeah, right. and it's great because these these are quotes unique to the tuck boxes. It just gives you a little more content, a little more flavor. Yeah, without having to read a twenty page book, I really like it a lot. And you open it up, and you feel like you have something that's substantial. Awesome, that's fantastic. Really great. Um, so, so tell us about the process. What are some of the things that you guys are building? This, what things made it into the game that you're proud of, and then what are some things that had to get left on the cutting room floor? Ooh. Um, what did we cut out? I think when I came when I came on, the, the game was still going through playtesting, so there was a whole bunch of items that didn't that didn't make the cut that uh, uh, would love to be love to go back to right. um, with with you know future with future mm-hmm. expansions. Um, uh, it's t- I mean, I don't want to say too much about what we might do next. I mean, we hope that everybody likes this one and, and, uh, and we're encouraged enough to make a second game. And I, th- I think if we did that, we'd look at uh, maybe zooming out from the... Because st- the game takes place on a single street. Right. right. Well, well what's, what's the next level up from that? Where can we go with that? We pull back further, show a little bit more of the world, get a little bit more deeper cool. into the narrative and the backstory to it. Because, yeah, this, this was... This was as Andy says, uh, it turned out to be a little bit more effort than that. But yeah, this is a quick and easy little game to make. <laughs> For him, sure. 
Um, so yeah, well, the next one is yeah. I had a, I had a blast. I had absolute uh, a wonderful time doing it, and I'm I'm happy to keep dipping in. Saying oh, we're going to do a promotional thing for this event. Oh, I'll draw some more cards. Oh, I now I now know what I want to do. So I'm talking about designing some of the cards for the next booster because I think now I've got a really good handle on the game. Mm. Um, I you know how about this? How about this? Would this add a cool little flavour? Would this would this put a little bit of a spin, a little playful spin on some of the gameplay? Um, so yeah, moving forward, there's certainly a lot more uh, of that kind of stuff we wanted to do. We had, there's a card in the game called Pretty Petticoats. We were going to do a variation that was called Outrageous Pantaloons. <laughs> I was still very keen to paint, and uh, I did a sketch of them, and they were outrageous pantaloons. <laughs> so I'd certainly like to go Just back. waiting to be yeah, I know, included. big cod piece and everything, it was crazy. <laughs> So I'd love to go back and do some of those things that we just we had to we didn't have it's not that we didn't have time it's just that um, my you know I was spending my time selectively on what I on, on what right. I thought would enhance the, the whole look and feel of the game uh, as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Do you have a, a feel because I, I look at this and I just think of how much unique art there is. Do you have a feel for how many pieces you've done? How many unique pieces you had to do to? Uh, it was 50, list? yeah. Like, 50? Uh, 50, 50 original, 50 unique pieces, plus the backs of the cards, mm-hmm. plus pieces around the side. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of 60, 70 pieces of art, uh, you know, in the, in the 100 there, cards. And you have, you have to sort of see it to appreciate it, but, and I'm sure on your website there's some of the sample artwork so people can look and see the level of detail. Yes, and our Twitter feeds. And our Twitter feeds, because the level of detail on any one of these cards could be a piece of art you'd hang on your wall, yeah. especially if you're a fan of that sort of. I overdid dark it, fantasy. quite frankly. No, it's amazing. <laughs> I think that, that's what adds, I mean, that's what makes the game really. Again, you can't help but like look at stare at the cards for a moment and really get drawn into what is that cleric story? Why does he have that weird look in his face? Why is his, why is there that scar on his whole forehead? I, I hope people people see that it's a labor of love, right? Because you know, it absolutely was for, for, for both of us. Well, all of us, everybody involved. Um, because I think we've all we've all worked for other other companies for a lot for a long time, and you always give it your all. You you always do your best when it's something that is truly yours. Mm-hmm. I think that you, it, when everybody when everybody's come up and bought a copy at this show, I, mm-hmm. I feel I really genuinely thank you, thank you, because because it means it's it, it's it's sort of uh, 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 recognizes the the efforts and rewards our efforts for, mm-hmm. put into it, which it sort of confirms our faith mm-hmm. in what we in what we've done, and hopefully then. Um, provides us the impetus to, to keep going with this. So I want to ask you, so this is, we're at Adepticon 2016 right now, right? In the middle yeah. of the show. And this is the premier event for the game Dark Deeds. Yes. First time it's been available to the public. Yep. I know you guys announced it on the internet a few weeks ago, but no one's actually seen the hard copy of it. What's been the reaction? How have you been feeling about folks' reaction to the game as you show it to everybody's It's been interest? fantastic. And a lot of people have come by. A lot of people have, have sat down for little demos that we're doing. And uh, and a significant number of those people have bought, have bought the game. You know, And again, this is Adepticon. This is not a, this is a miniatures-driven right. event. So um, uh, for us to be here and to be as well-received as we have been has been fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's a, a real vote of confidence in what we're doing. So, Excellent. yeah, it's been great. Fantastic. Are you have any questions for Mark? This has been awesome. Uh, no, I, I just I love it. <laughs> and I love so all much. the art. Thank you. It's amazing. I, I hope a lot of people get this game because I want to see what comes next in this crazy dark me, universe me you guys have created. Me too. Me too. I'm excited to find out what I'm going to be drawing next. So, the Mark, next chapter. thank you so much for taking time out of the thank con today to, to spend some time with us and have a great rest of the con. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is Total Fangirl. Regular Jane most days total fangirl when the moment strikes. Han shot first, Starbucks is a guy, and Lestat now there's a vampire. Hey everyone, I'm Nicole, your total fangirl. You can follow me on Twitter at Nicole Wakelin and check out my blog totalfangirl.com. Thank you to all of our wonderful supporters who support the show by heading over to patreon.com slash the D6 generation. We very much appreciate the support. It was a big week if you happen to be a Star Wars fan, and that is because the trailer for Rogue One finally debuted. And whoo baby, was it a good trailer. If you're a Star Wars fan, this thing had you going nuts. It was really, really good. And everyone's really excited to see what almost looks like it's going to be sort of a darker, grittier version of the Star Wars universe. And to hear some stories that we never really heard before. We know where it happens in history, but it's sort of like the time that we didn't get to see. So it'll be neat to see what happens with these pilots and with the rebels sort of becoming the rebels. And I'm excited about it. But one of my favorite parts about the whole thing are the arguments that this trailer has started everywhere online, particularly my Facebook page. There's some marvelous nerdtastic discussions happening on Facebook amongst my friends about who the different characters that we're seeing are. Now, the extended universe was thrown out. They said that when episode seven came out, that 
doesn't matter anymore. Any of that stuff that you read in the books, it's not true. But if you paid attention to the movie, you'll see little bits and pieces of that universe kind of made it into the movie, sort of tweaked and modified. But you could see how a lot of those stories may have sort of helped inspire some of the events in the movie. So you can't help but wonder if the same thing's going to continue to happen. So people are trying to decide who's who and what's what. And are we seeing, you know, glimpses of the future that we have characters that we know? Or are these characters from the extended universe? My favorite one, my favorite one is Admiral Thrawn, because he was amazing in the books, for those of you who read the books. And But he was an alien. And the guy that they think was him is clearly not an alien, or he looks human anyway. And he shouldn't if he was from the extended universe. But then maybe they changed it and it's him. But the change is that he's kind of human or looks human or did something to be human. I don't know. But if you are a Star Wars fan and you have not yet seen the Rogue One trailer, what on earth are you waiting for? And what rock have you been hiding under for the last few days? Check it out. Let me know what you think. And I'd be really curious to see if you guys think that that could be Admiral Thrawn that we're seeing in the white capey cloaky thing looking all so imposing. Hey, welcome back. It's time to about, talk about our friends over at Geek Nation Tours. Let's uh, talk about vacations. Let's do that. It was great. We were just at Adepticon, ran into Terrace and the whole crew from Geek Nation Tours and all the touring geeks there at Adepticon. They were having a blast. You know, what's fun is that these guys, whenever you see someone walking around a convention in a Geek Nation Tours shirt, and they all get one, which is awesome, yeah. and they're awesome shirts, great themes, great artwork, Walk on the shirts. It's funny because these guys are the most energized, most engaged, and I'm here to tell you they're doing the most too. Because not only are they going to all the events at the convention, Terrace has yeah. hooked them up with. These guys got a demo before it was even out of the new Star Trek game coming out from Gale oh, Force Nine yeah. this summer, and they were I was tweeting like, pictures, I making was us all jealous. So jealous because I flew in late. I didn't get to go to the Geek Nation Tours event. And I was like, oh man, I missed out. It was so awesome. So the Terrace hooks them up with special things, hooks them up with the best meals. They go all the best restaurants in the area. Uh, you know, you're in Adepticon, make sure you experience the Chicago Deep Dish Pizza. No problem. Terrace has got that covered. And if you want that same sort of experience at Gen Con this year, there's no yeah. better way than Geek Nation Tours, right, Craig? That's right. And that tour is uh, it's closing up fast. So mm. if you've been on the fence, it's time to decide to come join us at Gen Con because they know how to do all these different conventions right. Terrace is there. He's with you. He's taking care of you. Uh, or one of his representatives who is equally knowledgeable about what's going on. Uh, he makes sure you go in eyes wide open up at the front and helps you organize your entire con- convention experience. So he's bringing you to all the events at the convention. As Russ said, if there's events off site, he's, he's letting you go there too. The, uh, they went to, um, to uh, medieval times, yeah, right. which is always a fun time. And like, imagine going to medieval times with twenty or thirty of your closest friends, all sitting at big banquet tables, eating big giant turkey legs, and screaming for your favorite knight. They got the chance to do that, and that's just one example of all the cool stuff that these guys over at Geek Nation Tours do to make sure that you get the full, complete experience and don't miss any of the cool local flavor. And don't forget the things they get you to do that you couldn't do any other way. For example, Craig and I will be DMing. Uh, yep. Short D and D sessions at Gen Con this year with members of Geek Nation Tours. So, want to play with us D and D? No problem. Go on Geek yep. Nation Tours to check it all out. This is the Dice Tower Network at dicetowernetwork.com. dot com. Hey, everybody! Welcome back. And of course, as you may have noticed, if you've listened to the last few shows, uh, Kings of War has started to show up on our radar, uh, mainly because of Adepticon, which of course is all of the cool miniatures games that you could possibly imagine. And uh, if you follow Owen on uh, Twitter or Facebook, and why would you not? Exactly. Then you know that he plays Kings of War. And we've had a few people who have asked us to talk about Age of Sigmar, which we don't play. Uh, And so we thought we've been trying to get Owen on the show for months and months and months. And, of course, he's super busy with everything that's going on. You know, he's a marathon runner now. And he... He's a he's a storyteller extraordinaire. Is the are, are you the, the the storyteller laureate of Wales yet? I wish, Craig. I wish <laughs> one day I'll be appreciated. Just one day, you know. Well, you're appreciated over here. You are, Owen. Very much. Maybe I'll come over there. Yes. There you go. Yes. You could be the official Welsh storyteller of America. Right. Or maybe I could be. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That, that's yeah. not nearly as much competition. <laughs> no, there's not. No, I could be the only no. one. No. Yeah. yeah. There you go. It's like being the uh, smallest giant. Yeah. <laughs> See there. <laughs> There you go. And now you know why we've been trying to get him on the show, of course, as 
as everybody knows. And uh, this was the perfect opportunity for us to talk about both Kings of War and a little bit about Age of Sigmar, which uh, which Owen has played as well. So, Owen, welcome back to the show. Thank and, you. Oh, and uh, and so um, let's talk about Kings of War now. First, uh, did you did you start playing Kings of War before or after Warhammer Fantasy shattered the old world? Oh, uh, well, it, it was funny, you know, Craig. It's a, As you know, for years and years and years, I've always been a Warhammer fantasy player, going back to um, the first ever edition back in the early yep, 80s. Yep. And um, over the years, I gathered army after army. I'd been to tournaments. I'd been over to Texas, as you know. I'd been to Memphis. I'd been all over the UK to different tournaments. And I've amassed army after army of these figures. And in my little study upstairs, it's my, my perfect little man cave, I walk through the door, and there I've got this cabinet with a glass face on it, and it's full of shelf after shelf of Warhammer armies. And I was happy in my little Warhammer world. You know, I'd gone to the 8th edition, and, and a few friends had fallen away, but I was still gathering and building armies. But then suddenly it all disappeared. You know, it all sort of went up in smoke with the old shattering of the old world, which was nicely done, but unexpected and a little bit um, a little bit sad, really. But some of us could see it coming. And um, a few friends of mine had played Kings of War for a little while before that, but it's nothing I, I'd been involved in. I'd not seen it or anything. But since Warhammer just went away and now we've got this sort of fragmented scene where people are coming up with their, the Ninth Age, which is like an unofficial um, Warhammer system. Um, some people have gone on to other systems and everyone's going everywhere. To have Kings of War just appear on the horizon was a bit of a godsend to me because all those old armies now covered in dust and webs have been brought out of the cupboard and taken to the table once more. And, um, and it feels really good. And it's like um, a throwback to yesteryear, if you want me to use that term <laughs> and um uh and just to see um uh, what it was like when i first started gaming and um yeah it's, it's been a real revelation to be honest very cool now was it a so you so what attracted you to kings of war was that all your old warhammer fantasy battles armies could come to the table again um did uh did any of the new kings of war models also attract you or was it more the, the fact that there was this unified rule set that seemed that the community in your area was starting to get attracted to yeah, well, what it was, I think, um, having always been a Warhammer player, but then in the last couple of years, as as you, as you know, the, the fashion has gone towards more sort of skirmish-based games. You mm-hmm. know, I played a lot of War Machine, played a lot of Malifaux, mm-hmm. uh, played a lot of those smaller systems where you were just putting gangs of figures together. And there was a long sort of inbuilt yearning just to see those huge armies on the table once more. Right. And, um a lot of friends that I know, um, I go up to Bristol occasionally to play, and they got into ancient war gaming with uh, War and Conquest. And, and when you actually came in, after playing, say, um, War Machine for a number of months, and you actually see a war game being played, a big war game with uh, historical figures or whatever, there is something about that that's very mm-hmm. attractive to gamers maybe of a certain age. And that, that sort of desire to get back to that, you know, where it was... It was a nightmare to carry your figures wherever you wanted to go. But when you set them up, the game was almost secondary to looking at the spectacle, if you like. Mm, right. And uh, that is what attracted me. Um, as far as armies have gone, yeah, I've, um, most of my, the games I've played have been with my old Warhammer armies, my Beastmen, my Undead, my Ogres. I've all now got a new lease of life on the Kings of War field. But now I've started building a little dwarf army um, using all new figures. I've used um, Avatars of War. I've used some Games Workshop figures. I've used semantic figures. I've used a, a whole range of figures and put them all into creating uh, sort of um, dioramas of units, if you like. So it's been a real, real um, sort of throwback to sort of nice. old-style gaming for me, and so, I've so really enjoyed it. So for you, it's, it's being inclusive. You can use all these different fantasy models that inspire you. Now there's a game that can play with them. So when you first sat down and started playing Kings of War, what did you think of the rules? I mean, was it like, well, this will work because I have the visual on the table or did the rules really appeal to you as well? Well, what was um, the biggest thing that hit me first of all? I bought the new edition come out. The uh, the second edition came out, which is a, a bit of a, a move forward. I didn't play the first edition, but I'm told a few things that were wrong in the first edition have been addressed. Mm-hmm. And there's a lovely little hardback book that is the second edition. It comes. It's it's quite small. It's thick. It's full of nice pictures. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a real nice book. But when I started looking through it, I've got it in front of me here, and, and it's full of nice pictures of figures, old, um, uh, some lovely new drawings of um, that Mantic have come up with. Mm-hmm. It's very, very old-fashioned. And my first thoughts were, 
God, this is gone. You know, this is dated. This is 10, 20 years beyond its time. You right. know, there are dwarves and goblins and ogres. And strangely, I, if you've noticed it, this all this stuff has sort of fallen out of fashion just slowly and surely over time as we go into the sort of uh, the more sort of um, in-depth backgrounds and cyberpunk stuff and Malifaux stuff and, and Guild Ball where everything's a bit edgy and a bit cool and a bit different. To go back to these old armies... Mm-hmm. I, I didn't know whether I would take to it. You know, I thought this is really old fashioned, but this is the fantasy I was brought up on 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. This is the fantasy that brought me to the table, if you like. And to go back there was like bumping into old friends once more. Mm-hmm. And the rules were secondary to what bringing back those big armies and that feeling when I first got into wargaming. That's that um, imagination, if you like, that opened up that the cinematic sort of play of a of a full wargaming uh, when it's out and going on the, on the field. And that, that brought me um, right back into it and that, that's what brought me to the game it wasn't really the rules but when I started playing it I realised how tight they were and how tactical they were mm-hmm. and how actually a good balanced war game it actually is great well let's talk a little bit about some of those rules and what, what you like about them I think it's I think it's really it's an interesting story Owen and I think a lot of it echoes what a lot of gamers feel now which is I have these great old armies. I mean, I, I, Craig, this happened to you, right? Almost while you're sitting at the Mantic booth at Adepticon was you yep. realize, oh my gosh, I have these this Dark Elf army just sitting there. I can play it tomorrow if, you know, and that kind of thing, right? Yep, absolutely. It's, uh, I mean, I Warhammer Fantasy was never my go-to game, but I always enjoyed it. And it was another key, which people will understand as a running theme in my life is it's one of the few things that I used to be able to do to get your brother to the gaming table because mm-hmm. <laughs> he always loved his dwarves and uh, and Joe and, and Pete always loved his elves and Joe uh, Joe is more like us. He's willing to play pretty much anything. Uh, um, but so there's always been my nostalgia to that game has always really been getting my old group of friends who don't really game that much anymore, finding something that they're interested in that will like get their juices flowing and I, I sold an Empire Army, a complete Empire Army. So I, that, I, that's the only one of my Warhammer armies that I sold, though. So I still have my uh, Warriors of Chaos. I still have my Tomb Kings. And I still have my first love, uh, my Dark Elves. And so uh, I knew that, man, that, 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 that Kings of War was out there, but I didn't really think too much about it. And then our friends... Um, Local friends, starting with Andy and Matt from the Nerd Herders at Adepticon, were like, oh, by the way, we just bought into Kings of War, which made me think, oh, maybe this is something that we can do. And then I went, so I went to the booth, and uh, Dave and I had a, a demo of it, and um, thoughts of which I will seed throughout this uh, conversation. But it was interesting enough that I uh, went and downloaded the rules, and I wish that I'd actually bought the rule book because it has the tomb kings equivalent and the kings uh the the I, or i think the the warriors of chaos is in the secondary supplement so between those two i would have had the army lists for two of the armies i have and uh the dark elf equivalent list which is the um twilight kin is not out yet but they have a tournament approved army list on their website that you can just download so that i've already got so i'm looking at that i'm thinking it's really cool and yeah, so I think it, it it could very well fill that niche, and that's what I'm sort of looking for. So let's let's go through these rules a little bit, and and Owen, I, I'm going to ask you to guide us because you played the most games, um, and I know the rules aren't super complex, so I don't think it'll take us very long to go through the basics here. But um, you know, uh, how does how does movement work? First of all, I know for fantasy games since you're moving those big blocks of troops, you know, you get wheeling and all these other kind of rule complexities for movement. How in movement? How does movement handled in Kings of War? A movement is incredibly simple. I mean, you've just got a basic stat line for all your units. Mm-hmm. And um, as we, we were discussing earlier on when I was saying about my modeling, the units are basically one model. So you don't you, you can have all your figures loose or you can create some superb dioramas. You can get these real nice images of what your unit's going to look like. But um, the uh, the stat line, you know, starts with speed, and the majority of uh, troops uh, they have a speed of about four or five inches. Some have got six inches, and you can just move that on the table. But you can also move at the double and just double the speed. Mm-hmm. So you it, it sort of moves along the table quite well, quite quickly, and very very simply. A movement turn will take um, you know a few minutes at most. It's a very very quick system that can be played with a chess clock. 
um, or can be played without as well. I've never used the actual the clock, but um, the movement system is very simple. You can pivot slightly, you can charge, um, you can move units out of the way. It, it works really well. Some have got um, special powers like being nimble, um, so they can pivot more than once in a turn. Mm. But very, very simple. The yeah. whole rule book is simple. It sounds it sounds very simple. And so you said a couple things in there I wanted to highlight for our listeners. One is that you said everything's just sort of like one big model. And what they what Mantic did and sort of a core mechanic here, and I think this is pretty innovative. So you mentioned before, Owen, that you know the game feels old, but yet there are elements of it that feels you know really interesting and like new ideas. And one of them yeah. is that when you say a unit's one model, what you really mean is that. Every unit, the, the unit blocks, if you remember Warhammer Fantasy Battles, you have all those, you know, let's say you have a unit of goblins that is five goblins wide and, you know, four goblins deep, so you're talking about 20 goblins in a block, right? In Kings yeah. of War, that block is essentially one model. You never have to remove anything from the block. You never add anything to the block. You simply move that block around the table, and that block is the same size the entire battle until it's removed from the board. There's no, like, partial... Goblins don't die out of it individually, right? So it's one big blob. And the movement system, and correct me if I'm wrong, from the demo we saw too, looked very simple. You either move straight or you pivot. And then can you pivot then move or you just pivot or move, right? Yeah, you can know you can pivot. You can pivot once and move. Yeah, right. So um, you can do that sort of basic uh, sort of pivot and move without losing any sort of movement. Right. And it's really simple. But you don't need to worry about pivoting in the middle of your move. So there's no wheeling or, or, no, or nothing like corner, that, no. any, that, any of that stuff, which what's probably cool when you think about other games that do it that way is more realistic quote unquote but it adds a lot of complexity what if you had a tree and all these things and this is just a very simple uh mechanic to get around the table and as you mentioned there's special rules that add the ability to pivot more than once and all these little, little things right and your art you had a lot more arguments too when it was the wheeling and right once you get something that fiddly into the rules then you're going to have some people who are you know, uh, abusing that. You've got some people who are more loo- fast and loose in their in their meta, and other people who are super tight. And you've got just human nature is going to be well. I, that's what I want to do, and up oh, it looks like me. I can do it. You know, so uh, it really gets rid of a lot of that. Now, Owen, is it? I think you can pivot in the middle of a move if you want, right? As long as you're just doing a standard move, you can take one pivot anywhere along that move, I think. Yeah, it's something like that. I'm not going into the full depth of it, but it's right, very right. simple. I've not had yeah. it at all, you know? It's, and uh, the games I've all played have been quite friendly as well, so it's it's all... The, the movement is actually very, very loose and very, very simple. It's all about getting the troops into the combat, which is what you really want, isn't it? You know? Right, the second absolutely. Thing, the, the second thing you mentioned, Owen, I wanted to call out. So, mm-hmm. so uh, Craig and I were able to watch, and I thought this was really interesting, at Adepticon, they had about a 30 to 40 person Kings of War tournament going on. Right. And it was really fun to watch for a couple of reasons. One, as you say, there is these massive armies fighting, right? So you got that great visual. They've got models from Age of Sigmar mixed in with old GW models, mixed in with other stuff, mixed in with Kings of War. So first of all, Kings of War tournament, there's no rules about whose models you have to buy. You don't have to play with just Mantic nope. models, which was cool to see. And it was an amazing selection array of conversions and different things. And I was just blown away. And I couldn't tell where the GW models started and stopped. I mean, I don't know fantasy well enough to be able to you know, name models on site, but it was just a beautiful looking army. The second thing I noticed was people seemed very relaxed. They were all smiling and relaxed. It wasn't like, you know, I mean, there were some people that were obviously very serious about it. I don't mean they weren't serious, but it was more like, very relaxed, but at the same time, every single table had a an iPad or an iPhone on it, and they had chess clocks, and they right. were using the chess clocks to time it, but we would go up, and we would look, at it, and I could see there was a chess clock, I see it was determined, so I didn't want to disturb them, so I'd go up and take a picture, say, can I take a picture while you're playing, and they would start talking to me, oh yeah, this is Kings of War, we love it, and they're in the middle of their turn, and I'm like, aren't you worried about, ah, nah, this is so fast, I'm not even worried about the time, we're doing fine, and they're, it was just sort of like, so to your point, Owen, the game looks beautiful on the table, clearly plays with enough strategy to have a nice meaty tournament where people are really into it at the same time it's not so brain burning that they can't take a moment to talk to someone who's interested in the hobby right it was really really exactly it's i've never come across such a relaxed war gaming (laughs) and um, experience and what is kind of nice about it is there are only six spells right there's like a fireball a wind blast a couple of little things so you haven't got all these intricacies and these little powers that you need to know of everybody everybody basically knows what everybody can do you know mm-hmm. and and there's nothing that makes you feel cheated or wronged it's all quite relaxing you always think oh i'm going to do this there's nothing um, you know um, there's no super powered beings who are going to uh, destroy you no matter what it's all very balanced and it always feels fair and even if you lose a match you feel like you've had a good match and that's what uh, 
I, I like about it. You know, you have, it's very relaxed in its in its play, which is lovely and really nice. really refreshing. So I want to ask you about magic real quick, and maybe we should talk yeah. about combat first before we get into magic to make it simple. But let's talk about combat for a second. So the other thing that really impressed me um, about the game was I did like the simplification of movement because I do remember playing War Machine Fantasy Battles quite a bit. I also participated in several grand tournaments. I played Warhammer Fantasy reasonably competitively for a while. Yeah. And I do remember some of the some of the, you know, the interesting things we got involved with the game, although I also really enjoyed it. Um, but the combat system to me in 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 Kings of War was really interesting. Um, can you describe it real quick, Owen for us? Yeah, no problem. You uh, you charge in, you get your troops in. In that turn, only you fight. Like in Warhammer, if you remember, you would fight and your opponent would fight in your own turn and then you would uh, conduct a winner. But with this, your troops charge in and each of your troops on your stat line has a, basically a melee score. And that could be four plus or five plus. And then you roll, no matter how many dice you've got in, in the stat line as well, it tells you how many attacks the unit has. So for example, if your unit has eight attacks, you roll eight dice, and if you get four plus or a five plus, whatever's on your start line, those attacks hit. And then you have to beat your opponent's defense score. The more armor they've got, the higher the defense score. So if you beat those, then you score that amount of hits on your opponent. Now, each opponent has a nerve score, which um, is a, 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 a number broken up into two. For example, it could be 10 stroke 12. You then roll two dice. If you get over 10, the unit becomes disordered. If you get over 12, you break the unit and you add the amount of hits that you've done. So that is how you break a unit or make a unit disordered. Very, very simple. Very, very straightforward. And across the board, all the units work the same. So it's depending on how many hits you've got. Um, there are powers like Thunderous Charge or Strength, which make it easier to hit people or take away... Um, uh, bits of a pawn's armor to make them um, easier to hit, mm-hmm. but very, very simply done, very straightforward. Cool, um, very good. So yeah, so just to sum up, I, I thought this was really fascinating, and I wanted to get Craig's thoughts on it too. So you basically roll to hit, you roll to wound, right? Uh, yeah. So you're rolling to hit them, you're rolling to break their armor or their toughness. I want to think about it. You do some number of wounds. Now at this point, when you normally you would do wounds in 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 Warhammer Fantasy Battles, you'd be removing models. So if I had a bunch of lizard men and they all had one wound each, and Owen did five wounds, I'd got to remove five lizard men from my base. But in Kings of War, that's not what happens. So if Owen does five wounds to me, I just put some kind of marker next to my unit to say I've got five wounds on this unit. And the way I started thinking about it, they actually call them. I believe they call them wounds in Kings of War. But I started thinking yeah. about it more as like stress or fatigue or whatever. And you just put it on the unit. Um, the this the amount of wounds you get. Now this is interesting. This and this might bother some people. Um, the amount of wounds don't impact the fu- the fighting capability of the unit. So unlike in fantasy, when as you're removing models, you're removing the number of swords that can swing. You're moving your rank strength. You're removing yeah. the number of arrows you could fire or whatever. That doesn't happen as long as you have some wounds in the unit. But the unit's just as effective as it was when it started the game. However, whenever you have to make one of these. Uh, it's called a nerve test, Owen, I think? Yeah, a nerve or break test, whatever so, you want to call it. Really. So, you, so you make sort of a psychology test. You roll yeah. 2d6 and you add the number of wounds on your unit, right? That's and correct, yeah. There's there's two numbers you're trying to avoid getting higher than. If you get higher than your nerve number, the unit now is a little less effective. But if you get higher than the other number, your unit is destroyed and you simply remove it from the table. That's correct. And boy, Very no, soon. snake eyes are always a save, right? And it's sneak eyes are always a save, and a double six is always a break. So there's always a chance, even if you only do one wound to a unit, you can wipe them out. There is. And there's always a chance that no matter how bad your situation your unit's in, they might miraculously stay around for one more turn. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so that's pretty much, and ranged attacks are, are sort of, the, and what's also interesting too, right, is after that combat, after you charge, the units bounce away from an inch, right? They do. They bounce back an inch so that in the following turn they can come back in. Or if they're disordered, it's beaten the first score, they Mm -hmm. can't counter charge. So because they're disordered, they can't come piling back in. So it leaves them a little less effective and sort of vulnerable as well. But what's interesting about this, and it's sort of interesting, is that because the units aren't locked after the charge, it solves a whole host of of rules complexities you get when two units are locked together and then game balance issues and how to quite disengage and what do I need for rules. None of that happens. There's simply no persistence from turn to turn. You you charge, you fight, you bounce away, new turn, the units are an inch apart, you can do whatever you want. You can back up, yeah. you can you know turn sideways, whatever. It right? also makes those mud pit units that you used to get in Warhammer Fantasy where you just get a giant block of zombies or whatever. Mm. Those are slightly less effective because if you hit them and do a bunch of damage, first you get a chance to get them to route. 
then again, in the next, in your next turn, especially if they're disordered or uh, if they're that first level of uh, of nerved, uh, you can shoot at them, try to get the, r- rid of them again, so your big combat unit is free to move well, yeah. the next turn. But so it gives you more tactical options, also. I thought. And what's interesting is, oh, go ahead. No, it does. It's very much the tactic. The tactical options are great, and if you can get flank charges in, you can double your attacks. Mm-hmm. If you can get charge in the rear, you can triple your attacks. So it's all about bringing your units where you want them to be and um, and hitting people that way. And uh, there's so much sort of depth to it. I mean, the rules are basically just a small amount of pages. There's something like twenty or thirty pages. But when you actually play it, you realise how deep it actually is. Uh, but in a nice way and, yeah. and in a very learnable, very easy way to do it mm-hmm. very good i really yeah, the, I, I, the, 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 the downloadable rules are only 27 pages there we are and uh, that, yeah, I, yeah. I think actually um the uh the printed book is exactly the same you know it's very very yeah, yeah. small most yeah. of it is taken up with the army lists etc it makes me really want to play the game because the essentials are all there right so you've got flanking you've got rear charges you've got morale you've got all the things you need to have in a very simple system i like that shooting is essentially the same mechanics right you roll to hit you roll to wound and you make the, the the test right same same deal exactly uh, the same so i love that how does how does magic fold in is it essentially the same mechanics no magic is a little bit different right. um as i said there's only six spells so all you do in your shooting phase is you get your wizard who basically, um, yeah, when, when I say it is um, a similar mechanic, you just choose what your spell does. They're all effective, but not game changing in any way. Mm-hmm. You can do a fireball, which is effectively just a good, um, like firing a cannon or, or firing a lot of archers or as a wind blast that can move units just a few inches, which could push someone out of charge range, for example, or, um, you know, put them into some sort of vulnerable position. Uh, so the magic is very, very simply done um quite atmospheric and effective but isn't the problem you know and it's not game changing it's not you're not going to lose half an army through a lucky cast of a spell or anything like that it's very very simply done great and and does it does the game feel less you know fit, it seems to me the game looks more tactical and less random and fiddly like you know and i know there's some debates about you know, dice rolls for your charge distance and stuff like that in various versions of fantasy. Is mm. is is the game less random in that way? Do you feel like it's, it... it's far less random in that um, the, the movement is quite fixed. Um, you know, I quite like the random sort of uh, the mm. charges, but it could be very frustrating when mm. you've got everything in the right position and uh, through no fault of your own, it all just falls apart because of a bad dice roll. Right. Uh, but with this, you know, that, that all that is quite um, straightforward. What you haven't got is the massively overpowered characters. Right. I mean, the characters are like little units on their own, but you throw those in against a unit of troops and they're going to lose, you know? Mm-hmm. They're good little support units, but they're not um, a massive game-changing thing like they were in fantasy on occasion. If you had a big dragon riding beast master or something um, who could destroy whole units on his own, um, in Kings of War, the units are everything. It's all about the troops, really. Right. And even big monsters don't have that much of an effect when they come up against big ranked units, you know? Cool, very cool. Now, so I think one of the dangers you get, so that's great. That's pretty much the rules, right? Do we miss any major part of the rule? No, that's pretty much it. I I can guarantee any of the listeners, really, if they picked it up, just have a little read over the rules. You know, a third of the way through the first game, they would soon be picking this up game up and playing it. I mean, there's a lot more to it. There's a lot more depth to it, but it's a very, very simple game to get into. And and, I'm, and that's what I'm asking you about next. So, so does some of the depth come from, well, first all the tactical options on the board, but also in the different factions and in the different keyword powers of the units. So one of the challenges sometimes when you have a really, really simple, elegant rule set like this is the factions all feel sort of the same. So yeah. you've played quite a few games now. You've got different factions you're playing. Do the factions feel different? Do they feel correct? Yes, they do. Um, I've played with my ogres a lot. I had a lot of success with my ogres. They were all big units of ogres, which I was slamming in there and, and sort of uh, winning combats and doing well with that. But then I've started playing with my old Beastman army, which is a lot more, a lot different to play. And um, it's taken me a long time to try and work out how that sort of works. You know, they, the subtlety of them um, leaves a lot of armies are quite hitty. A lot of armies need to be quite elusive. There's a lot of um, uh, armies with a lot of shooting attacks. Um, the undead are good because they can surge forward using magic. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of different. Um, there's a different feel to all the armies so far that I've seen or come across. That's been really, really effective. Very cool. Very cool. Um, and do they do that with? Is it all keywords and special abilities, or is it just the, the way they can 
adjust their move, their, their basic stats like movement and their morale and things like that? It's basically um, the, the stat lines. It's all in the stat lines. Okay. You will have thunderous charge and strength and nimble and units with fury and things like that, which give them little advantages in combat. You know, um, a cavalry unit with thunderous charge may be able to, to take away the armor, sort of bonuses against uh, infantry, etc. But again, nothing is game changing. It's all very, very straightforward and very, very simple. And um, yeah, it, it, it's a great, really elegant game. Um, and what I like about it as well is I found, because I don't game as much as I used to mm-hmm. um, you know my life is busy with my family my work etc so sometimes I'll go three four weeks without playing a game but when I was playing like War Machine when I was playing Malifaux etc unless you were playing all the time the game could run away with you mm-hmm. you'd sort of forget um, certain rules or you'd um, you wouldn't pick things up with this you can walk away from it come back two months later play a game and pick it up just as easily again and don't feel cheated well, do, you know what, do you understand yeah, what I'm saying I do that's, that's really cool um, yeah I like that. I like the elegant simplicity, and and, and uh, I, I do like that part a lot. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, army building. And, well, and actually, wait, oh, before ahead, we do that, I want to. Yeah. I, I had some thoughts that yeah. I want uh, Owen's uh, commentary on, and and a couple things that we talked about from the demo in the last episode. That when I went back over it and played my little uh, my little solo thing, that I kind of like uh, changed my opinion a little bit. And the first thing was. Um, the uh the the fact that all weapons are the same basically so like there's no strength of a weapon so a longbow and a and a gun and a handgun are all there's no strength of a weapon anymore in this game and i thought that would sort of take away a little bit from all the different complexities but there are special rules that some weapons have in that kind of add that in with keywords like you said russ mm-hmm. so i thought that was interesting um the next thing that was my big problem that I think you addressed a little bit, Russ, is that the unit performance isn't degraded by the wep- by the damage that they've taken. And that kind of bothered me that you could just pile on the damage on that unit and it's still going to be working the same way right up until it dies. But then I started to think that Warhammer Fantasy, basically the only thing that dictated your, your uh, effectiveness in battle was your frontage. Right. Well, no, yeah. your rank bonus also is a big. Yeah. Well, your rank, your rank bonus, but I mean, I mean, I mean, as far as like your shooting and things like that go. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you had what the models in the front rank were the only ones who get to attack, mm-hmm. pretty much. And well, so, in the eighth in, edition, they addressed that somewhat. But yeah, I, I understand where you come in. You know, it's um, right. It's, yeah, that's true. They like sp- if you had spears or if you had long spears and stuff like that. But for the most part, it was that front rank. And that wouldn't have changed anyway. So even if you pile in a bunch of attacks on uh, on a swordsman unit, as long as you didn't degrade the front rank is, and, and they were okay leadership-wise, they were going to attack you with the same number of attacks. So that's not as big of an issue and a, not as big a difference in uh, Kings of War as it looked like is what, I was, is what I discovered when I was running through my little, my little play of it. Hmm. And I thought that was intriguing because... That was my problem. It was like, well, well, like in Warhammer Fantasy, I'm sure that this unit would not be as good with like half the models gone. But that's actually other than, like you said, Russ, the flank bonus. I mean, the the rank bonus. Mm-hmm. That's uh, so. That's the only real issue is the rank bonus, rather than actually degrading right. the, the 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 unit. So I but thought the, that was interesting. And the other thing to think about is the rank bonus really was around the morale check at the end, and the right. wounds on the unit do affect the morale check at the end. So that right. kind of works out. You know, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, so well, the other uh, thing I'm not I, quite oh, done oh, yet. Keep going. All right. <laughs> it's not the Russ Wakeland show. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> now, the the main thing that I think is interesting because it sort of goes away from game design philosophy, uh, cur- as it currently stands in the industry, is the movement in the industry seems to be constantly everybody's interactive. I mean, Infinity's tagline is "It's always your turn," right? Yeah, And even in Warhammer Fantasy, you're taking your armor saves, so you're engaged in your opponent's turn. And that seems to be a big hit that a lot of people take against games where it's like, uh, Warhammer 40k, oh, I can just walk away, go to the bathroom when it's not my turn. And Mantic has really embraced that aspect of game design where you literally have nothing to do when it's not your turn. So your enemy is taking his moves, he's attacking you, He's making your leadership role for you, and you're just kind of like watching it all unfold, and then you take your turn. And that's really a huge departure, I think, from where most other games are going. How is that 
and that's obviously something that I couldn't really experience when I was sort of doing my own experiment. Oh, and yeah, is, yeah. Is, is, is that um, <laughs> is is that like a big change to you? Like when you play this versus other games? Well, I think that talks back to what I said about it being quite retro in its yeah. um, in its outlook, you know. And it, it was like a real throwback. And when you look at the pictures and that, it's like looking at a book that could have been produced um, in the late eighties, you know. But um, for me, that was a good thing. And that harked back to the sort of social aspect of gaming, where um, you'd play a game that would last maybe two hours, and you'd be playing, but your opponent is playing. And I kind of, kind of enjoy my opponent's turn when I'm watching what's going to happen, because that's when I'm thinking about what I'm going to do next. Right. And um, you've always got, oh, I hope that doesn't happen. I hope that doesn't happen. Oh, God, I hope they hold. I hope they hold. <laughs> All that is going on in your head. But it gives you that time to actually sit back and think about what you're going to do next. I kind of like that downtime. Um, I know, you know, I play a lot of games where it's always your turn. And, uh, and that could be quite good as well. But for this, to have that downtime was part of the experience for me. And I really enjoyed that. And the social aspect of it was really, really good, you know. Excellent. Russ, what do you, what do you think about that? observation and that aspect of the uh, game. I have mixed feelings about that. So a lot of games are actually um, War Machine pulled back on a lot of that in second edition. So, yeah. And the reason it's a problem is it creates a lot of fiddly mechanics. So unless the game is designed from the ground up to really have strong player interaction in both players' turns, it causes problems. So like in the end, near the end of War Machine first edition, um, you know, there were the Bane Knights could move if he did this. And if a unit took too much damage, it could do that. And you could react here and react there. And since the game isn't built that way from the ground up, it actually broke a lot of stuff. In other games like uh, Antares, where they really thought it through, and it's going to be, there's a reaction system and everything's built in, it works. But if the game's not really designed that way, it does break. And so the other part of this is that um, a lot of people designing board games now also do this. They don't. They build it in this way where it's when it's not your turn. There's nothing to do, and that way you can make it work on a on a on a pass and play device, or uh, if you ever make an I, 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 iOS version or something. So they could be going that route as well. But I think in general it's more the retro thing, and I think they wanted to have sort of the I move my army, you move our, your army feel of the the older school games, like Owen's saying. And I think if you're going to go that route, you want to stay away from the reaction stuff because otherwise it just tends to break the game and removes the simplicity. Now you do all these rules about what happens when this guy does this and this guy does that and you're in the middle of your charge and you take wounds, you make the check, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and each their own. I mean, it's great to have games that interact that way, but right. I like this as well. You know, it's, 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 it's nothing wrong with it. Uh, having that sort of downtime and, and actually really thinking hard about what you're going to do in that time that's given to you. And it's, um, because it's it's quite a social game and there's a lot going on. I, I've never found myself bored. You know, it's nothing I've really thought about. Really, it's um, right, it's right. been it's been quite easily done. You know, excellent. Okay, okay. I'm done. Oh, good. Okay, so I, I really wanted to ask about army building. So, oh, when you establish that the factions are different and they feel right, yeah. and and you don't need to really memorize a lot of stats, you can just look at a unit on horses and say, "Oop, they're going to be fast and nimble or whatever." Um, yeah. Do you? Um, how is the army building part of this? Uh, you know, that's one of the big. Uh, sort of debates about Age of Sigmar where there really is no army building rules. Uh, what kind of, how strict are the rules in Kings of War and what do you think about them? It's very, very good. It's again, very retro. Every unit has a points value. I mean, most of the games are played to about 2,000 points. So, for example, a regiment of mounted uh, sergeant knights is 160 points. And you put it together like that and you're basically allowed to take what you want. There are a couple of rules. I mean, if you have a um, a horde or a regiment, then that allows you to take a couple more monsters or heroes, really. But if you've got the figures, you can use them. And um, it's all about... It, there are a couple of sort of diagrams, very 40K, like, you know, about how um, uh, a regiment allows you to take two monsters, etc. But it all sort of works itself out. If you've got a basic Warhammer army that you've created, it will basically work in Kings of War. You can just transfer it over very, very easily done. And um, a 2,000 point army will give you a good sized game that's going to last about two to three hours, mm-hmm. um, a good old fashioned sort of war game. And army building is very, very easy. There's a lot of different options in all the army lists. You've got 11 army lists in the first original book, and they've brought out a supplement called Uncharted Empires that contains another nine army lists, mostly armies that have just, you know, 
a Warhammer armies that you can bring into this game, but they've also got some sort of underwater people and, and things like that, which Mantic are going to produce their own figures for as well. So it's very, very easy to bring an army or create an army. And if the points value system, quite old fashioned, but it works for me. Cool. One of the interesting things that I noticed about army building is that it doesn't break it down into like heavy guys and elite guys and things like that. It's all dependent upon the size of the unit. So the size of the unit, you have troops, regiments, and hordes. And what constitutes a troop, regiment, and horde really depends on that kind of troop type. Sometimes it might be five. Sometimes it might be uh, increments of ten. Sometimes three for things like chariots and stuff. And that's what dictates what you can have, basically. So like one regiment allows you to have two troops and one war engine, monster, or hero. And then the horde, which is usually about 40 models, so it's a big, big unit, allows you to have four troops and then uh, one each of a war engine monster and a, and a, and a, um, and a hero. So it really, it's not a question of, well, in Warhammer Fantasy, these guys were elite, so you really could only have a certain number of those. You could have a whole army of that kind of unit as long as size-wise it breaks down for you, which I thought was interesting. And really, as Owen says, it kind of frees you up in your army building compared to the old days. But what it also does as well, it sort of encourages you to take regiments and hordes. So yep. what you're looking at is big armies rather than small little troops moving about the table. It's all about the big unit, you know, which looks yep. good, obviously, as an aesthetic. That's very cool. That, that, that sounds really neat. I like that. It seems like a good balance between, um, uh, you know, a heavy structured building versus, um, you know, a way to balance the battlefield. I like that. Exactly. And I just recommend to anyone, if they've got old Warhammer units, just break them out and give it a go because um, you'll find that it's, it's a real throwback to what I uh, used to enjoy a few years ago. And um, uh, it's nice. It's a nice, relaxing, easy system, um, which I've learned. Uh, Sid, I've got to give a, a shout out to Sid. He's my friend at the, the club who brought me into the game. And he taught me the game in, you know, under an hour, really. And wow. I could play it to anyone now. And it's it's very simple and very rewarding. I, I really enjoy it. Well, we're running a little long, but I really wanted to make sure we got this one last topic in which our listeners kept asking about, which is how would you compare this to uh, to Age of Sigmar? What are your thoughts? So when you've played both games, what do you like about this compared to Age of Sigmar? What do you like about Age of Sigmar compared to this? Totally different games. Absolutely, totally. Age of Sigma, I think, in a few years' time, will be looked back as, um, you know, I don't know how many people are playing this. I, I don't know anyone. There's a huge problem with the points value sort of system. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very uh, story-driven. It's very um, new. And I think in years to come, it'll look, it'd be looked back as quite revolutionary in the way it does things. But it's a totally different game. I've only played Age of Sigma twice. I've enjoyed both games. They both had to be very scenario driven for it to work mm-hmm. because um, of the lack of points value. Um, and it was also, to me, it seemed more of a skirmishy type game. I mean, I played with the uh, the Stormcast Eternals and I had about 30 figures on the board. My friend Justin, um, he played with uh, the Nurgle Demons and he had about 10 monstery type characters on the board. And, uh, and that made for a good game, but purely because we played a, um, a scenario. I think you've got to go with the story sort of version of the game in Age of Sigma. It's very individual characters with keywords, can be quite complex, even though it's only a four-page rules. Um, It's certainly a new way of looking at a game, very, very modern in its outlook. But Age of War, uh, um, King... uh, what, what, what I Kings call it, Kings of War, <laughs> is, a, um, Kings of war is a, an old school war game. Age of Sigma is something new, which I don't think we've seen uh, the full depth of it yet. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's fair. That's interesting. Now, uh, when we were talking to people at Adepticon, they were mentioning that it was all about the scenarios and that really made the game. And they seemed to say to be saying that the scenarios that GW is providing aren't really that great and that the game really shines in these uh, in these conventions and tournaments where the people are coming up with really cool story driven scenarios can you speak at all to that or is it uh have you just sort of been playing out of the book i've been playing out the two games i played have been out of the book and um they were with a friend and in a friendly environment and uh, we we're just learning the game and enjoying it i'd love to know what they're doing in like in adepticon and in these tournaments to produce a um, almost a points value system but because i like making stories and i like um developing things and i you know i'm making things quite cinematic in my mind i like it i like age of sigma and i hope 
there's a lot of bad feeling with it, obviously, because what it did to Warhammer and it's moved the system on, the price of the figures is high, but the figures are good. Um, I'd like to see it given a chance, and I think it's a start of something really good, but it's just the start, and I'd like to see where GW are going to go with it next. Mm. But I'd also, I'd love to play in a, um, an Age of Sigmar tournament. If anyone knows of a good local one, please get in touch, because <laughs> I'd love to get over there and see how it works, because that's when you see a system for what it's worth, isn't it? When you get with lots of other people playing lots of different scenarios. So, um, yeah, yeah, I'd give it a go, but it's, um, it's certainly something new. Yeah. Well, we should also say that all that all the people who are playing Age of Sigmar seem to be having a lot of fun. Yeah, they did. Just like all the people at Kings of War and all the people at Ninth Age, which is the uh, the fan driven attempt to resurrect and maintain Eighth Edition. So yeah. uh, it, it, it seems like you you kind of like people are sort of I'm sure the local gaming um, scene is 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 pushing some in one direction or another. Uh, personal taste is probably pushing some people one direction or another but mm-hmm. as people sort of filter out they are seeming to still enjoy where they're landing yeah that's right i mean it, it's just purely for me i i play when i can um i play with a couple of friends i don't know anyone other than my friend and i who are playing age of sigma mm-hmm. i mean i've decided i i bought in some of the books i quite like the background i love some of the new figures they're bringing out mm-hmm. but i don't know how it's taking off I don't see a lot of people playing it, and that must be concerning because um, they, GW have brought a lot into this. They've thrown right. a lot into it, and I don't know how popular it is, and that's the only thing in my, in my concern. Oh, and do you expect, since you're seeing a larger community in your area with uh, Kings of War, do you expect, since you like the Age of Sigmar models, you'll be using some of those in your Kings of War armies? Oh, certainly, yeah, no problem at all. In fact, I'm doing that right now with my dwarf army. I'm using some of the new Kings of War dwarf um, troll slayers, the fire slayers as they are. They are my slayers for um, for this army. Um, mm. Some of the figures are absolutely beautiful that are coming out. But such is the fractured way of gaming these days. There are right. so many systems. Right. That, um, whereas in the past, you'd have a lot of 40K players, you'd have a lot of uh, fantasy players. Now everybody seems to be playing whatever they like, and uh, mm. which is a good thing. But um, you haven't got the big communities that you once had, I find. Yeah, I think I think you def and Craig and I talked about this. We definitely saw at Adepticon um, the the fracturing of the Warhammer community, the, the, the fantasy army community, as you can call it, where we saw three equally sized events, all about thirty to forty people, uh, one for Kings of War, one for Age of Sigmar, and one for Ninth Age. All seemed to be equally passionate. All seemed equally excited. It reminds me very much of the split that happened when. Uh, you know, Dungeons and Dragons went to fourth edition, and some people really liked what fourth edition became. A lot of yeah. people did not, and you ended up with Pathfinder. Um, and and that fracture, even though fifth edition's out, and a lot of people like that a lot, you st- that fracture will never really fully heal, right? Pathfinder will be around for many many years, and arguably could become bigger than D anD D. Who knows? But so that's so I I think that's kind of where we are with with these two games. It sounds like they're very different though, and 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 you should explore both if you're interested in fantasy battles. Oh, indeed. And um, the background, when you actually start reading the Age of Sigma background, it really shines. It's yeah. it's really different, but it's very, very good. And um, I hope to be at uh, Adepticon next year, and who knows what I'll play. You know, I may throw myself into an Age of Sigma tournament, hey. and I'd look forward, and I'd really enjoy playing it. It's yeah, really right, I'd do both, Owen. Try both out. You could use the same armies. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I could do. I could use both armies. I'd, I'd totally, you know, and, and do it again. And I'd like to play it a bit more, and maybe come back on and, and talk a little bit more about it in the future. That would be good as well. Any, any excuse, you're always welcome. That's right. Any Thank excuse you. to get you back on the show, Owen, is a good excuse. So we love that. And if plan. you go to Adepticon, we'll get that Guild Ball game in. We will. Yeah, we certainly shall. We uh-huh. certainly shall. We certainly shall. Excellent. Good. I look forward to that. So, Owen, thank you so much for taking the time to visit us this day. Absolutely. We really no, appreciate it. Thank you for having me, guys. It's always lovely to speak to you. And, um, yeah, it's great. And uh, we should try and do it more often. I really enjoy it. We and should. all the best to all the, the listeners as well. Thank you. And, and, Owen, if people want to find out more about you and what you're up to, uh, where should they go on the Internet? Yeah, the best places to go is uh, my website, which is owenstaten.com, which tells you a bit about my storytelling. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of links to some YouTube videos I've done. But please, please follow me on Twitter, at owenstaten. And uh, please, please, you know, drop me some questions. And uh, I'd love to chat and see what uh, what people are doing out there. It's great. I don't game as much as I can because of, um, uh, or as much as I want, because the way things are. But I always like to know what other people are doing. And uh, please, I'll I'll, I'll chat with anyone who wants to get in touch. Excellent, excellent. Well, Owen, thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you in the near future. We very much hope you you make it out to Adepticon sometime. Oh, yeah, I'd love that. We'd have to arrange something if we get there, guys. That'd be fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah, you take care. Take care now. You too, Owen. Right. Bye-bye. 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 This is brought to you by all of our fine friends. 
friends at Patreon, the men and women who stepped up and helped out and keep us going long after we probably should have stopped. And today, in particular, I would like to thank Andrew Wallacher, Andy Rucker, Dean Clark, Frank Reynolds, and Rachel. Thank you, boys and girls, men and women, for stepping up and helping us create this not-too-horrible mess. Do you ever notice how things sometimes tend to balance out? I am uh, right on the verge of leaving for Peru. Very excited. Going to go see Machu Picchu and Lake Titicaca. Say that without giggling. Uh, However, things are ridiculously busy as I'm trying to leave. I have just received a photo of my first independent novel. uh, And that's exciting. Uh, Because it was actually accompanied with an email that said, did you get this yet? So clearly it's in the mail. Unfortunately, it probably is going to get here after I leave. So that's not great. But it's excited. I almost cried just seeing that it exists. So that was cool. And the cover looks awesome, I think. Uh, I have recently, as uh, you guys who have lasted this long in this episode probably already know uh i took a job with fantasy flight and was very excited to do that worked on some fantasy stuff that was neat and then immediately took a job uh with sam stewart again to do some more uh star wars stuff and now i'm like uh because I told them I was going to Peru, and that seemed to not make a big make it a big deal. So I said yes and signed the contract, and then realized that uh, the deadline for the outline was supposed to be today, uh, which is like the day after I signed the contract. And my fifty percent word deadline is two days after I get back from Peru, where I'm not going to have a computer. And so, yeah, I'm feeling crushed. But they're always great to work with and and understanding. And they realized that they also kind of made a little mistake with the scheduling. So that's good. And so uh, I've been working like a dog all day today. And I kind of missed out on one of the last days with my family here to try to get it done. But you make a commitment and you sign a contract and you stick with it. And that's kind of the way it goes. But uh, as far as balance goes... I'm more interested right now in money that I've been spending on gaming because I cannot tell you how often we hear people complain about how much money we've forced them to spend. Well, first of all, we didn't force you to spend anything. It's just there's so much cool stuff out there and you spent it anyway. But it always makes you guys feel good, apparently, to hear that we spend money also. So... I was thinking that I would walk you through a little bit of the craziness that just happened over the last week and a half with me and uh, Arena Rex. So uh, you guys know that Arena Rex was very exciting at Adepticon. Really, really enjoyed watching the demo. Couldn't quite get a demo myself because uh, the they were doing full games instead of just demos. And so uh, they lasted a long, 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 long time. And if you didn't time it just right, you missed out. But a couple friends of mine... Did get in there, uh, Nerd Herders, Dave, and I think he was playing Andy, old Andy. And I really enjoyed the game, but they were sold out. I went through there like four times looking for stuff that I wanted, and I didn't really know what faction I wanted, but they almost were, they were almost completely out of almost every model, so I didn't do it. And then, of course, they were having a sale uh, during Adepticon. So when I got home a couple days later, when I went online to look, not only did I realize how could I not go with the Legion Ludus, the guys that are based around the Roman Legion, loosely in their fluff, uh, but it was also on sale. So I jumped in with uh, everything. Okay, I bought, there's only six models, but I got them all. And, you know, they're not cheap, uh, but they're beautiful. And I got a rule book. It's only seven bucks, so, you know, why not? And I got some dice, but they were sold out of all the other dice, but I got all the dice that I could get. Uh, and I need more, by the way. You're going to need a lot of favor dice is the key. And uh, 
randomly off the spur of the moment, all of a sudden, I got the models, I put the models together, and the very next day, a couple of my friends who don't normally get to game were both like, hey, we're free, want a game? And I was like, oh my god, that would be awesome. And so I put together my Dwarven Forge Arena, and we played two games, and it was a blast. It was a lot of fun, and it's fast, and it's furious, and there's a, there's a little vague, weird wording thing where fatigue is used to describe an entire rules mechanic and a level within that rules mechanic. So that gets a lot... That the, the only real confusion revolves around that, but I think that's only minor. Uh, but it was crazy. It was awesome. And that entire week leading up to that, of course, I'd been super excited to try. I, I decided that I didn't need a Playmobil arena. I mean, it was awesome at Adepticon, the Playmobil arena that they had completely done up to make it look like a really cool 28, or it's probably 35 millimeter arena. It was awesome. I think I could do that, but I mean, come on. You know, the the few that were um, on eBay during Adepticon all went for between $70 and $100, and they all went like that as soon as people realized that they could do that with this game. And then I went online, and there was one for like 300 and there was one for 250 uh, and Andy had got one, but he got the wrong one because you got to be careful because they, they sell them that are only half of, a, of an arena, and of course, what good is half an arena if you're doing gladiator combat? So... Uh, he went and he bought another one that was a full one for uh, some ungodly amount of money. And then I noticed there was an auction. And the auction was for a a a, call, a, a full arena with lots of Playmobil guys and extra pieces. And I thought, oh, cool, some extra helmets and whatnot. And it's only 50 bucks on the bid. So I'll bid. And then, and then bid again. And then I, then I bid again. And then this weird thing happened. And uh, it's all tied to my phone now, so I feel like I'm getting a whoop or a whelp or whatever it was called back in uh, the office, if you remember those. And um, and I got uh, – so I got one of those, and it, everything was, like, lighting up. Oh, you've been outbid. And I looked, and I was like, oh, yeah, looked, I got outbid. Well, that's great. And not two minutes later, I got an email saying, oh, that bid was just retracted, so you're the high bidder again. But now everybody knew what my high bid was, and that really made me angry. So I went, well, you know what? I'm going to go up again. And I went up again. And then uh, I got outbid again. And then I went, you know what? I'm going to go outbid. And then I convinced myself that I didn't need it. And it was going to cost me too much money anyway. And so I went to bed that night deciding, you know what? I'm not going to bid again. And I got all the whoop, 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 at about 3 o'clock in the morning to notify me that I had won. And I was like, oh, how do I feel about that? That's a lot of money. That's easily the biggest thing most expensive thing i've ever gotten off of ebay bar none and i was like yeah i don't really know how i feel about that but you know what if i don't feel bad then i pretty much feel good and i'm like yay so i got it so it was okay uh and the shipping which was 25 dollars, which i thought was crazy i got it two days later which is awesome so i was super excited and then i opened it and those of you who follow me on twitter at the d6g at d6g craig uh you will know that when i opened it i actually found that it contained almost two complete arenas so i'm only missing the front gate to give myself two full arenas and a bunch of uh toys that reese loved to get uh, and so I gave him all those toys and he, he loved that. So now I have an awesome arena. And then of course I was really weak and I was like, Oh, what other cool stuff is out there? And I found this company whose actually stuff was kind of garbage. So I'm not going to tell you who they are. Cause it was really, I was very disappointed. I wanted some statues and I wanted some columns with Roman heads on them. And, and I found this, this place and I paid way more money than I wanted. And I got that today and it was really really cheap and i figure it's all this is where balance comes in see because i figure it's all balancing out so i got first of all i have two arenas that's crazy for the amount of money that i paid although i'm not still sure why i need a second arena but but i have one and then i was all excited and elated about that and it's all built out on my pub and it's all neat and i haven't painted it or anything yet or mounted it i'm gonna have pits in it and all kinds of cool stuff then I got this package from this this the toy t t toy soldier ish kind of company, and uh, yeah, and I'm really not happy with anything that I got there. So I feel like I'm back. 
I'm back to basics. And then, of course, most of the day was spent. I'm like, oh, my God, I've got to get this done for the Star Wars stuff. And it, it does become a task and it's grueling and then rules and I don't like writing rules and stuff like that. But at the same time, then I've got this copy of my book on my computer all of a sudden. It's all exciting. So it's been kind of a roller coaster ride and uh, I'm exhausted and I'm looking forward to a nice, relaxing vacation of climbing mountains and walking through ancient ruins uh, in exhausting heat. So that should be great. Uh, so that's about uh, I've just rambled at this point, and I am sorry. To be totally blunt, I just got kicked out of the living room because my wife wanted to finish watching one of the uh, Real Housewives reunion shows, and I couldn't handle being in the room any longer. So I came down and decided, oh, crap, I'm going to have to do this, or the entire episode gets put on hold. So here I am. There you are. I'm done. And that's about all I've got to say about that. Thanks for listening, and good night. Achievement unlocked! You've made it to the end of another D6 Generation episode, the podcast whose humor has universally been acclaimed as not too horrible. Please let us know what you thought of the show by either emailing us at info at the D6 Generation.com or by posting in our official D6G episode thread at the top of the DACA discussions forum on DACADACA.com. If for some inexplicable reason you actually enjoyed this show, you can help others find out about it by leaving positive reviews on iTunes. See you in two weeks. Thanks for listening, and happy gaming. The theme from Total Fangirl comes from the soundtrack of The Last Night on Earth, The Zombie Game, courtesy of Flying Frog Productions, and is a composition of Mary Beth Magalini's. How's, how's the running going? The running is going quite well. I, um, I started running uh, in the new... Well, I've been running for a couple of years on and off, right. but um, I took a new job um, a couple of years back, and I, I sort of more desk-bound. So uh-huh. um, I started running again at the beginning of the year uh, with the aim of doing 100K a month, uh, which was quite a lot. And um, yep, yep. in the first first month, I got to 96K, and then I tripped over a drain and broke a rib, oh, so, <laughs> which was an ouch. Man. So I've just sort of got back into it now, and I'm hoping to do a half marathon in two months. So it's going okay. 100,000K in a month? No, 100K. 100, 100K. 100, oh, I was, was going to say, what are you, some kind of robot? Yeah, what am I, Forrest Gump? Not, <laughs> not that 100K is not ridiculously impressive as well. It's fantastic. No.